do that. So I'll call the meeting of the select board of February 5th, 2018 to order at 6.34 p.m. Um, we'll start with opening remarks, announcement, and gender review. First question I'm gonna ask is, uh, who amongst the uh, guests that we have here are here for public comment not related to an agenda item? Is anyone here for public comment <coughs> other than agenda related items? If there are agenda related items, we'll call on you when those things come up. Um, is there any changes to the agenda that the select board need to make or any comments? I will mention just as a FYI, I did leave something for you on the desk tonight. It, I also sent an electronic copy um, moments before I left my office, which was on my way here. It'll hopefully get loaded to the electronic packet, um, which we'll discuss a little bit later. So, barring any other news announcement, yes. That's a quick question, so thank you for reminding us that you gave us this. What's different about the Black History Month proclamation versus the one that was in our packet? Um, on the second page, there in the packet, or in your hard copy packet, not the electronic packet, it said um, the words flag raising, celebration, oh. and um, begin with a flag raising ceremony in the, in the bottom line. Mm -hmm. of, and the flag raising already has occurred, so we deleted okay. the word flag raising from it. Okay. That's the only difference. Probably better the, anyway. The uh, advocates asked that we put the flag up on February 1st versus waiting till your board meeting and things like that to okay. raise the flag. All right. So we'll move into our agenda for the evening. Um, and I think we'll go into our action discussion items. And the first thing on our agenda is the 2018 CDBG recommendations, a review of those items. And so, Mr. Malloy, if you join us and kind of walk us through what you have for us. Sure, thanks. Uh, Nate Malloy, I'm a planner with the town, um, a staff liaison to the CDBG Advisory Committee. Uh, in your packet, there is a memo from the committee and uh, the cover memos or cover pages for the proposals. <coughs> the town uh, received two non-social service activity proposals and seven social service. Um, you know, in the memo, I'll back up a little bit. You know, the town found out in, in the fall of this past year that it was a mini entitlement again and could apply uh, for up to 825,000. And it's not a given necessarily. So, you know, the process started a little later than usual. Uh, some of the minis now only get about 675, um, but we've had a good track record, so we're fortunate there. The, um, the committee held a public hearing in December to help formalize the community development strategy. The strategy helps determine priorities for funding and target areas, so as a mini entitlement, we need to target our activities to certain areas in town. Um, and so we have a few target areas where a lot of the activity has taken place. You know, we can't be town-wide, unfortunately. Um, and then, you know, it also identifies priorities for social services. And then we, you know, we, we uh, put a request for proposals out. We had a little over five weeks. They were due January 24th. The committee met last week and made recommendations. And then there's tonight's meeting and there's a hearing um, on Thursday, February 8th. It's a requirement of DHCD that the public um, provides comments on what activities are gonna be included in a town's application. And so for the non-social service, we can begin with those. You know, the town recommended funding East Hadley Road. It's a continuation of a multi-use path um, from 116. If funding allows all the way to the town line, but at least hopefully to Whipple Tree Lane, so it'll hit all the um, entrance and exits off of you know, East, Hadley Road, East, Hadley, East Hadley Road. The, um, the town received funding just this year in 2017, so the project has, you know, it, this, it would be phase two. Phase one is what the town just received. It's about 350,000, and this would continue it and hopefully finish it. And I'll give credit to Public Works. They've done more work in engineering and design to bring this along, so hopefully it can happen within budget. Uh, the second request for um, a non-social service, service activity was to update the transition plan. The Disability Access Advisory Committee submitted this proposal a few years ago, uh, and they resubmitted it. We worked with, um, we asked a few different consultants you know, what would be needed, and this estimate was, um, the original request for, was for 60,000, the block grant committee recommends 40,000. They think that you know, with this request, it, the plan can be updated. It may put a little bit more work on staff to do it, um, but they felt that it was something that they'd like to at least get the East Hadley Road project done and recommended most of its budget, and then the 40,000 for East Hadley Road. 
for social services, you know, the town likes to fund a maximum of five agencies at 20% of the grant application or grant amount. Um, it doesn't need to fund that. It could fund one or none. You know, that social services don't have to be necessarily a part of the um, application. The, you know, the block grant committee realizes there's a strong support for that in the community and a strong need for it. So the, the seven proposals were, um, were all, you know, pretty strong. The, uh, um, there's review criteria that the committee uses to review all the proposals. So they come up with kind of a, a rank score based on, um, you know, different comparative criteria. So the, you know, the need, the impact, feasibility, budget information, agency information. Um, and then they, you know, they, that becomes a basis for discussion on how they determine, you know, who, what five get funded. And so, you know, there are more, there are more proposals than could be funded and there was more funds asked that could be um, funded. So, you know, when the committee made its five recommendations, it was still over, over the budget. So I think a, a big thing that's been happening is more agencies have been requesting larger amounts of funding. Um, you know, if you fund five agencies equitably, it's about 35,000 to reach the one, the 165 um, maximum. Uh, this year, you know, even at when the committee recommended the five agencies were still over 40,000 over budget. And the big discussion was how do you, you know, then pare down the requests? You know, what, what makes sense in terms of reducing someone's, um, someone's ask? And, you know, they looked at, again, the budget information, you know, the capacity of the organization to either absorb the re reduction in, you know, the proposal or do more fundraising. They looked at the impact. I think it's, it's a difficult thing because some agencies who may have, you know, greater capacity, um, you know, it looks like they could handle, you know, a reduction in funding, but maybe they can't. So it's like, you know, how much do you, you know, if an, if an organization is really strong, is that, does that mean that I can receive less funding? Um, but I think, you know, it's something the committee mentioned and discussed and said, you know, going forward, you know, how does a town really address the community needs? Does it refine the needs and have and fund fewer proposals? Because if, if agencies are requesting more money, is that something that's really necessary to have an impact? You know, it's difficult if all the requests are over, you know, the 35,000, then every agency would have to have a reduction in funding. You know, in years past, some of the agencies have made small requests you know, 15 to 20,000, it doesn't seem like that's the case any longer. Most of them are requesting, you know, 20 to 30,000 or more. So, you know, the committee recommended funding five agencies out of the seven. The, uh, some of them have been, you know, received funding in numerous years. Um, you know, the five uh, that they did re recommend were the Survival Center, the Food Pantry, Amherst Community Connections for a one-stop resource center. It's a new, um, it's the first time this agency has been recommended for funding. Uh, there's Family Outreach of Amherst, and their Family Outreach has been funded in the past. It would be for a new program. They're looking at doing a community housing support program uh, to prevent homelessness and, and uh, counseling and casework management around uh, families and individuals who are at risk of losing their housing. There's the Literacy Project um, and Center for New Americans that provide adult education and job readiness training. And the committee felt that these five uh, recommendations you know, really meet basic human needs in the community. You know, it's, there's food security, there's job training, there's literacy. And, um, you know, so I think, you know, I think they really um, spent a lot of time discussing how, how they could then, you know, make the requests um, equitable in terms of the funding amount. And they felt that, you know, they did reduce um, three of the requests to try to keep within budget. And they felt that, you know, that the agencies that had funding reduction could could manage, um, you know, at some point it, it has to be considered whether or not the amount of, you know, reduction, for instance, if someone's asking for 50,000 and you reduce it to 30 or 25, if that's, you know, does that eliminate a position or does it actually make the program almost infeasible if it reduces it so much? And so, you know, that was part of the consideration. How do you, how do you make those decisions? And so, you know, the recommendations before you are something that they felt comfortable with that the programs could still move forward. There still be, um, you know, positive impact in the community. Other questions for Mr. Muller? So, um, in terms of insight as to the committee's process, thank you. That was a really helpful overview. And, you know, disclaimer, I've been to their meetings in the past, but not for quite a while now. So thank you for that update on how that worked. And I am curious about the fact that Amherst Community Connections has applied for funding several times in the past for a variety of programs. And what was it that 
given all the competing priorities, as you indicated, um, and given that we are not funding uh, an agency that we have typically funded in terms of Big Brothers Big Sisters, if could you characterize what um, what about Amherst Community Connections application this year convinced the committee that this was the year to move forward with that? Sure, I mean I think that um, you know Amherst Community Connections they've improved their applications from year to year, so they've taken the comments and, and you know constructive criticism and they really improved their proposal. They also had you know letters of support from different agencies and organizations um, vouching for the you know the impact that would happen with their one-stop resource center. It was also something that the committee discussed you know there isn't there's not a lot of services in town that help um, this population in terms of making referrals or casework and management. Um, you know it may happen at different agencies you know it's, this one works you know um, you know, it's, it's what they do full time as a as a program, and so it's something that it hasn't been funded before. Um, and the committee thought it would, you know, it it provides something that isn't happening right now, and that it does meet a basic human need. So I think, you know, given the the refinement of the proposal in years past, and and the letters of support and the impact they they recommended it for funding. Thank you. It's good. Um, I have two questions, and, and they're kind of different. Um, I know in past years, um, I've heard discussions about whether an agency could come back multiple years, and I know we've funded agencies multiple years, but right. not m maybe for the same activity or maybe different, and I wanted you to just update us on what the current rules or thinking was on that, and then I have a second question. Sure, so I think if, you know, the committee looked back, if you look back at the last five years of social service funding, there's probably only been about seven agencies that have received funding set in, in the past five years, and, you know, probably most of the time it's the same four out of five every year that receive funding. So, you know, the Survival Center, um, maybe Family Outreach, Big Brother, Big Sister, and the committee's discussed whether or not, you know, after so many consecutive years, does a, an agency receive reduced funding or no funding? and you know, DHCD is, you know, um, considered Amherst a mini entitlement program because there's community need, and so there's about a dozen mini entitlement programs, there's, you know, communities in the state, and so they've already predetermined that there's a need in the community, and so the committee discusses it every year, and like last year, they determined that they wouldn't, you know, penalize an application if it's been funded in consecutive years. They'll look at it based on the proposal this year and, you know, past performance if that was, you know, if there was things to report on. Um, you know, they again. They said next year they would have the same discussion. Do they start to reduce funding? You know, based on um, how many years. You know, if there's consecutive years of funding. But you know, their thought is that if an agency can document need in the community, we're not necessarily you know funding away our need. And so, you know, maybe that's true in some cases, and maybe some communities. You could say, well, you know, we funded one agency enough that wow, there's not you know a really big homeless population, for instance, or the food pantry's done a great job, and we don't need that anymore. But you know, in Amherst, it, you know, we the agencies provide information on the need, and the community members feel that there's still a need there, so they wouldn't, you know, reduce the funding after so many years. I could just my second sure. question is about evaluation criteria, reporting criteria. So, um, when you add a, a new agency, yep. what, how do you guarantee that they're performing or that they have adequately qualified staff to delivering the services? And right. you know, basically fulfilling the the terms of the contract and are are able to fulfill that contract. Right. So staff will meet with the agency and have a startup site visit, and we'll go over contract requirements. And then, you know, if it's a new agency, we typically have you know, there's conditions in the contract that there's monitoring. Well, you know, we'd expect monthly um, invoices and reports, and then there's a quarterly report that has summary activity um, information and budget information, so that um, you know, at least. Every quarter, you'd have some, you know, a complete summary of how they're going with their budget and the, meeting the scope of services. The block grant committee also holds a public hearing in April or May, so that you know this funding will become available more than likely in October of this year, with activity starting around October or November. So, the committee usually holds a hearing in April or May, about six months after contracts are up and running, to determine if you know if the project is meeting expectations and goals, and if funding will be spent down. So. That's another opportunity to to hear from the, you know, the um, programs, and a chance to either reevaluate or reallocate funding if something's not meeting the goal. Um, so you know, I think there's going to be there'll be staff oversight. There's strict contact contract conditions. DHCD has a standard contract, and then there's you know this public hearing process. So there's, you know, and then there's reporting. So there, 
there is oversight. I, you know, I think the, the committee in its evaluation looks at staff capacity, you know, board representation, agency information to determine if it can carry out the proposed activity. So, you know, the block grant advisory committee and staff you know, feel that the ones that are recommended can implement the, the programs that they, they applied for. Any questions, Mr. Steinberg? Uh, is there any um, administrative overhead built into the grants? Right, so, so there, you know, there's um, DHCD caps the administration amount at 15%. So, you know, 15% of 825 goes to pay my, you know, my salary staff personnel costs. Um, and then, you know, each agency, say for um, social service, there's, you know, in part of their budget request, there is percentage of um, indirect costs and overhead. So that's not factored in. So, you know, there's a 15% admin administration cap on the grant. And then, um, you know, each activity, there's a, an allowable, you know, reasonable overhead percentage. So, you know, DHCD expects probably in capital projects, there could be anywhere from 10 to 20% uh, contingency built into a budget. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, so I'm not sure what exactly if you're looking at it in terms of the overall. I'm looking at it in terms of each agency and, um, that is being proposed for funding and whether the there's a criteria that's being uniformly applied to all of the five proposed grantees. Right, so we ask for a detailed budget, you know, a breakdown of the budget of how it's prepared in terms of cost allocation and, you know, CDBG and non-CDBG, um, you know, funds if, if that's part of the program. So, you know, most of the budgets do show, you know, a, a line item budget and if what percentage is overhead and what, you know, if there's any match in terms of volunteer labor or time or, you know, what makes up the whole program. So we asked to see a whole budget in terms of a program, you know, with a 12 to 18 month implementation window and then where, you know, how the block grant piece fits into that. So every agency submits a, you know, a whole budget and you can see where, you know, where the block grant piece is and what other funding sources come in to make that budget. And there is, you know, but like I said, there is ad, you know, there's overhead and indirect costs built into most of these. So we'll fund a program, but part of that is, you know, we may subsidize their rent, utilities, or other, other things. It has to be incidental to the, you know, the program at hand. But other questions for Mr. Malloy? One thing I know has come up over the years, and so if you could just remind me of, of how it works again, if you haven't already and I wasn't, didn't hear it carefully, is Amherst residents versus non-Amherst residents. And we would never want to be in a versus situation, right, of course. And we understand that most, if not all, of these programs have a regional basis, and DHCD is obviously fine with that. But what I'm wondering about is if that played into the conversations this year and also why it's not called out on the application form specifically as something that people need to document on. I realize that you all got much larger packets than this, right. which are all right. available online, which I, you do a wonderful job with the website, having all that available. But in terms of the summary document, it seems like one of the things that we talk about a lot in town is different types of community service funding, some of which is directly funded through taxes and other which is done through programs like this, but to make it clear that we are not just serving Amherst residents. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing right. at all, but apparently it's not a problem for DHCD, so I'm wondering if the committee has considered adding it to the base cover sheet as sure, identifiable yeah. information. Further in the packet, it does, you know, ask, you know, a requirement that, you know, a majority of the beneficiaries are Amherst residents. So it asks that, you know, 51% or more be Amherst residents. It, you know, it's, um, so most of the programs do document that. They, you know, they, you know, there's self-decoration forms or there's other intake forms that document that they're serving a majority Amherst residents. Um, you know, I think most of the programs, you know, do serve, re you know, participants outside of Amherst. You know, so they're, if they are, you know, they have regional impact they serve more than just the Amherst community, that's not, you know, not a disqualification. Again, you know, the block grant, the major objective is that a majority of the participants are low and moderate income. So, you know, from DHED's perspective, it's both, you know, a focus on Amherst and that at least, you know, a majority of the benefits, benefits of a program are low mod. So, you know, if, um, you know, every agency here meets that national objective pretty easily without, you know, DHC doesn't really question that when we apply. Other questions for Mr. Moore? If not, then is there anyone in the 
audience that wanted to offer comment. So please come to the microphone, identify yourself, and. Hello, everybody. I'm Mindy Dom. I'm the executive director of the Amherst Survival Center, and I'm here just to share some comments and concerns about the recommendations that you've just heard about. Um, and, but I'd like to also respond to some of the questions as they relate to the Amherst Survival Center application, particularly around Amherst versus non-Amherst residents. Since we are an organization that's based in Amherst, we do have a regional impact, but we have one program in the center where we can clearly identify the residents, residential addresses of our guests and our participants, and it's the food pantry. And that's actually one of the reasons why we apply for community development block grant funding for the food pantry, because we can clearly document that we're serving Amherst residents. It's the only program that we require proof of residence, um, as well as other information from individuals. Um, and they do make self-declaration that they meet the, um, the community development block grant guidelines. So I just wanted to clarify that in our application, I know that we're viewed as a regional organization, but the particular program that we apply for, we can document that it's clearly the Amherst portion of the pantry. I think it's about 51 or 52 percent of the participants in that program are residents of Amherst. Um, and we actually apply for a portion of the Amherst portion of the food pantry, so if that makes sense. So that food pantry serves people who live in 13 towns, but Amherst is the largest one. Um, I just wanted to express some concern about the cut that we have in this recommendation. Um, I understand the decision making and the challenge around a limited amount of money going to a variety of social services. The Amherst Survival Center is not only grateful that the town always makes social service funding available through this program, which we know is not necessarily a requirement, but we've also received very generous allocations. Um, so generous that in fact this year we decided to up our request to keep pace with the allocations that we've received in the prior years. Last year we were able to receive $55,000 for the pantry. That went for um, a continuation of some very specific programs as well as an expanded allocation in people's monthly distribution. Um, and this year we applied for $65,000, trying to keep pace with what we saw was sort of interest on the part of the town to continue to raise it. Instead, we were recommended a 40,000, which is a 27.5% cut from what we got last year. So it's not just, I don't really look at what the cut is from the ask, I'm really looking year to year. Um, and it's a, it's a not level funding in terms of last year. This is a concern because we're looking, this is FY19 funds, and we're looking into the future, into a year when we're expecting and when people are talking about potential significant threats to federal food and nutrition programs, increasing the burden of food security on people who live in Amherst and across the country. And so to face a cut of that magnitude in a year when we're thinking we're actually gonna see increased need is concerning. So I just wanted to come and express that concern. And we um, have loved working with the town on the pantry, we think we've performed pretty well in all the ways that the grant is expecting us to, not only in the application itself, but in the monitoring, the delivery of service, and the fact that having the town sort of be a partner in, one, in several pieces of the pantry has given us sort of encouragement to take on additional programs um, at no expense into this grant, but that serve Amherst residents, including a mobile food program at South Point Apartments on a monthly basis. So I'm here to answer questions if you like, or. I don't think we have any, thank you though. Thank Anyone you. else have a comment relative to this? Hello, Claudia Cosmani, Amherst resident and board member at uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters, Hampshire County, and uh, I do have a little bit of a script, but to go off, off script a little bit to talk about, same as Mindy had just mentioned, that we too serve regionally, but this program that we applied for through CDBG funding uh, would be specifically for Amherst matches. So uh, it was to uh, support 25 matches in Amherst and new matches and 75 existing. So we're talking about 100 children 
of at-risk, low-income families that would be at loss, at a loss. So I would like to comment on the preliminary recommendations of the CDBG Advisory Committee for 2018. We know this is a difficult decision. So many committee, uh, community needs and limited funding. We've received generous funding in the past. We asked for the same amount we did last year. We did not increase it. So here, as a board member, I'm here to express my concern uh, about the identified priority of youth development and the decision, the decision here not to recommend proposals focusing on that priority area that we serve. I mean, that is our focus, youth mentoring. Um, I know that the CDBG Advisory Committee focused on benefiting low to extremely low income residents, uh, and over 90% of Amherst children served by our organization come from households that are very, very low, so as I mentioned. Uh, and I know that the committee decided to prioritize basic human needs. Big Brothers Big Sisters addresses those needs as well. But uh, from the side of prevention, children served are 40%, 46% less likely to use drugs, 52% less likely to stay at school, and more are likely to graduate high school and attend college. Uh, they grow to be leaders in the community. These are kids that, who are not otherwise seen, and they are seen and heard with a match. All these things contribute toward interrupting cycles of poverty and housing and food insecurity. CHD Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County has served children in Amherst through mentor matches for more than 40 years and has previously received critical town funding allowing our program to focus services um, in Amherst through a partnership with the public schools. And so with our application, as he has, um, was discussed, that we did have a letter from the superintendent as well to a comment on just that, that um, you know, the Big Brothers Big Sisters is one of the most valued partners and that partnership would be at risk. Uh, 60% of the children served by our uh, organization are from Amherst alone. So they are a majority of who we serve, even though we are a regional program. And 40% of the children on the countywide wait list are from Amherst. So, uh, and more children are continually referred each month. So the loss of town funding is truly detrimental to the partnership that could cause major, major disruption to mentoring service in Amherst. It would cause staff disruptions uh, and so forth. So it has a huge impact on our organization and our ability to do the work we, are, we know we do best. Um, but I just want to thank you for your time hearing my concerns, and I hope you will take this into consideration as funding decisions are finalized. <coughs> thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? There is. We can't do it this way. You got to come up to the mic and ask the question, or just step aside and ask her the question, just separately, if you would. That's so. Are there any other questions, comments, concerns, things we want to? So about? again, because I haven't been going to their meetings, and I've been very pleased we've been able to appoint some uh, new appointees, as other people have had to step off, and I know they've had some difficulty getting quorum after having so many longtime serving members step down, um, and I'm really hate it when people redo my work and so I'm trying not to do that right now but one of the things I'm having a hard time with is without going in and reading all the applications online which I don't really feel obligated to do I'm having a hard time understanding the comparison figures that are shown on these cover sheets because we have some cover sheets that say 2300 people are being served well obviously is that regards to this particular ask or by the agency in general? And so, and so I understand that we are not gonna have a price per person and I understand that it's gonna vary a lot, right? Because in some cases, you're trying to give somebody rent and you know, begin first and last month's rent, for example, which would be a much larger investment per person versus part of a staff person who does additional something else. And so I realize it's really hard to compare apples to apples but what I'm saying is it's really hard for us to do anything other than say, sure, you did a lot of work, we respect your work, that's great. But at that point, I'm not sure why we're bothering having this discussion because I, I can't make comparisons based on the information available here that, that are easy for me to justify to the community. What I'm concerned about is we're gonna get to town meeting and we're gonna hear from supporters of Big Brothers Big Sisters and say, you have funded them irregularly, not every year, I'm well aware of that issue, um, over the years, and they're benefiting Amherst kids, so we're adding money into the budget for them. And that could easily happen. And so 
I'm not saying the block grant advisory committee has to come up with a magic answer that will prevent that from happening, but I'm trying to understand, and perhaps it's more of a heads up for town meeting, that the community development <coughs> block grant advisory committee may want to be prepared if that conversation arises at town meeting as to why they made the choices they did for this money, because this money can only go certain places. We totally understand that. And then what other money might magically be found in the budget, which we know is going to not be a great budget year. So it's just difficult when people are trying to put very you know, impassioned speeches forward about really important projects that benefit people really greatly. So. I guess I see it a little bit differently than Ms. Brewer, and um, you know, if I were a board member or a director of an agency that didn't get funded or was cut, I would do exactly what the people who came tonight would do. It's your job to advocate for your program. And to me, these are a little bit like Sophie's Choice. These are all things we want to do. And so for the advisory committee to, to make sense, there's only going to be five. Um, they're picking a set of criteria or priorities, and I, I'm understanding from what we heard from Mr. Malloy that they're adhering to that. We're advisory to the town manager, so we might have questions or we might have suggestions that the, you know, the manager follow up and pursue certain lines of, of questioning or, or dig, dig deeper. I in no way think that we should read the applications. I don't think it's our job. I don't feel like it's my job to second guess the advisory committee um, although, okay, we're here to, to hear this and it gets it in the public arena, but um, I think these are really difficult choices and anyone who receives, any agency that receives block grant money does so understanding, one, that each year it's different. There's different shifting in criteria, maybe different members, and also some years we don't get funded. So you're sort of, it's great when you have that money, but always knowing that may need to be replaced because things we just said. So I'm very sympathetic to the needs are greater, really valid needs are greater than what we're offering to fund, but I am, uh, I'm inclined to support the recommendations with maybe, you know, some of the questions that we raised um, could, be, could be followed up by Mr. Bachelman, but I, I think this is just a really hard job to pick. Agreed. Or further comment from the members? Sure. Just come to the mic so we can pick it up on the broadcast. This is actually part of my concern in terms of the Amherst Survival Center application. Because those 2,300 people that are identified on the cover sheet, those are individuals who would be fed as a result of the pantry allocation as proposed in the application. So I just want to mm -hmm. be clear what that number meant since she expressed some concern mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about apples to apples and oranges, which happens to be a very, you know, interesting analogy foodie. when you're dealing with a pantry. <laughs> so there you go. Thank you. So at this point, do we, uh, we do have a, you know, motion on our motion sheet if we, you know, if one of the members felt like moving it or we could hold off if we wanted to craft some questions for the manager to get back to us with or Mr. Um, I, I think that I'm not inclined to hold up the motion if we um, have questions that came out of the discussion tonight and we think that the they're subjects that we would urge the manager to give consideration to in making the final decision on this because it is his decision not ours um, I think that would be helpful information to provide. Um, I think that they flow out of the ones that come to me flow out of the discussion. But um, I've, um, as Ms. Brewer stated, great appreciation for a committee that um, has put a lot of time and thought into this. And um, if the um, criteria were developed through a hearing process and then applied. And um, I think that's a really critical piece and it seems that, that they are. 
that that is what indeed what happened. Um, and uh, the only question that I might urge to look at is um, if a similar program was funded in the prior year and the amount that is recommended in the new year is um, significantly diminished as was suggested by one speaker, then I would hope that that at least be thought about, but I think that's as far as I would go. Otherwise, I'd be inclined to go with the motion on the sheet. Did you want to make that motion? I can uh, make the motion and uh, move that the select board endorse the CDBG advisory committee's prioritized recommendations to the town manager for the 2018 community development block grant. I would add subject to his consideration of items discussed at this meeting. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? So I'm going to vote for this, but I would hope and I would ask that the select board support me in asking the town manager to pass along some questions to the CDBG advisory committee, not to answer necessarily even in advance of this particular application being submitted, but in terms of the process moving forward. Because now that I've been further away from it, now more of these are occurring to me because I haven't gone to all the hearings and I haven't gone to read all the things in detail and it hasn't been 100% obvious to me how I explain to the community why this one and not that one, which is really the Black Grant Advisory Committee's job, not mine, but nonetheless. So um, one would be, I really, Mr. Malloy's memo, as always, is very helpful in terms of showing the admin amount, about 15% for the entire program, which is how we pay part of his salary, but um, in terms of the other limitations, just to maybe add a line or two about that. I mean, the committee knows that, but again, for the public's benefit in terms of understanding what that was, as Mr. Steinberg had outlined and Mr. Malloy responded to. And in terms of population served. Again, I'm sure it's in the detailed applications because it always has been. But like who's being served now and how many more people would be served or nobody's being served now because this is brand new but we think it would serve 35 people. Some of the applications are quite clear on that and others are not. It's not at all clear to me, for example, that Amherst Community Connections is actually serving 300 people now and would be serving 300 people then. That doesn't really add up somehow. But I'm sure the application made sense to the Black Grant Advisory Committee. It's just, it's harder for me to understand moving forward. Um, and how the dollar cuts impact could be added to just like a couple sentences maybe to the cover memo last next year. So we, I know that we, that we have talked in great length at Block Grant Advisory Committee in the past about that. You know, do you just say everybody takes a 5% cut to bring it down to the amount? Or do you say, and I know Mr. Molloy has reached out to the different agencies and said, what will happen if I change it from this number to this number? Will that decimate the program? You know, what, there's always a tipping point where you can't do the program properly anymore. It's not always, well, you'll serve 75 people instead of 100 people. It can actually make a really big difference when you make those level of cuts. And just for, again, to have that in the cover memo, I think would be incredibly helpful. You know, it isn't gonna make people happy. I'm not <laughs> pretending that that's gonna be the solution but to understand that, yes, the program will still work, but fewer people will be served, or no, we'll actually have to do the program a different way, or we'll only do it three days a week instead of once, something like that, would just give people context for, these are really hard decisions that the Black Grand Advisory Committee is having to make, and to understand that this is not, in fact, yes, I'm leading up to town meeting, this is not just money that you just throw money at a problem at town meeting and hope it all sorts itself out. This was really hard for them to come up with these decisions, and so just trying to throw some extra money at a warrant article at the general operating budget when we get to it is not a good way to manage things because you do have to go through this kind of elaborate process to figure out the competing priorities. As we have described every time at town meeting, the extra money's been offered, and town meeting almost always agrees to do it, and then we almost always have a really difficult time figuring out the appropriate way to program it given we have this other process. Can I just add quickly? Yes. Um, I think in, in um, going forward in, in the write-up, it might be important to make it clear that if an agency was funded prior and not, fund, and not recommended this year, 
that's not a reflection on bad performance. It's a reflection on shifting priorities of the committee. That this year, it's clear that they didn't pick youth services because those are the two that didn't get funded for whatever reason. I'm not going to second guess why, but that they picked kind of the ba basic services, food, shelter. Um, I would lead with that was what was the criteria this year and the, and the fact that, you know, and uh, a well-supported, well-run agency like the Survival Center because their full amount wasn't funded, that doesn't mean that they weren't doing a good job or what they do isn't vital, but to, to make it really clear that this was about trying to prioritize limited resources for more need than we could fund and not reflect in any way badly on you know, or as a net, as a criticism of the agencies that either didn't get funded this year or got less, so, you know, a way to lead with that. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Malloy. Thank you all for coming. And we'll move on to the next item on our agenda. Um, although I think. We should maybe skip down to our uh, public way, you know, section seven licenses, public way, and metered parking reservations. We have a couple of road closures, one of which is something someone here is potentially going to want to speak to a little bit. Um, so I think just as a courtesy to someone who's visiting us tonight, um, under uh, section seven of our agenda is a road closure relative to the Hartford Half Marathon. And so, um, didn't know if you wanted to mm -hmm. introduce sure. this a little bit for us and thank you thank you mr. chair um, there are, you have two road closures and um, do we do the Hartford one both of them at the same time or what let's do the Hartford one okay. first and then we'll work our way so back. as you recall last year um, on Veterans Day the Hartford half marathon was held in Amherst and they it was successful for them and they came back and wanted to uh, have the uh, marathon half marathon again uh, this year uh, in 2018 uh, they're looking at November 4th I think it is and um, the important distinction is that this is a um, professional company that comes in and runs road races last year 190 people participated in the 5k race which was held on Saturday 652 people ran in the half marathon on Sunday Nearly 94% of the survey respondents said that they were at least somewhat likely to participate again. Um, the traffic uh, impact was were pretty minimal. Uh, they, I was I was at the fire station and they were through the center of town within about four minutes of the start. So that, and the downtown had, had minimal impact. Uh, then people as they go along the race they get strung out a little bit. Uh, the Amherst Survival Center received a cash donation of $3,480. Uh, which is equal, and also 434 pounds of non-perishable food. Um, so one of the questions that we talked about last time this came to you was, um, was that were they donating enough money given that the um, marathon was taking place on, on public roads and utilizing public roads for uh, a business, a nonprofit business um, to conduct its operations. And um, so when we did some calculations, they, they donated about 6.89% of their entry fees to, um, to the survival center. Um, that didn't seem like a whole lot to me and I think to other members, um, but the sort of, as we looked into it a little bit more, it was became uh, their, their goal is to donate more money uh, over time, that this was the first year and they thought that if it got established, um, more and more people would participate, more and more funds would be raised, and there are different ways of, of increasing revenue, both through sponsorships as it becomes a more popular race, and through other, other means, uh, such as having a specially designated uh, Amherst Survival Center team uh, that gets special shirts, and then a larger percentage of those funds can go, things like that. Um, and just for the record, we had they selected the nonprofit. The town had nothing to do with it. It was part of their um, goal to make their pitch to why they should be given, you should give them the, the opportunity to reserve the roads. Um, so this year they've come back and they are interested in, in um, 
building this race. They, they say that they did not make money on the race, even with all the participation. They want to increase the n number of participants. And to that end, they've created a um, three-state mar uh, half marathon schedule with uh, one in, uh, let me actually have the locations, um, one in Rhode Island, and one in Simsbury, Connecticut, one in Western Lee, Rhode Island, and one in Amherst. And they are encouraging people to sign up for all three half marathons. And I think they sort of see half marathons as sort of a sweet spot for um, for the business or for people interested in running. Marathons are a major commitment, and it's a long time to recover. 13 miles, 13.1 miles is, is pretty good. So um, given that, um, one of the things that we would like to work with them on is um, where they start and end the race. Right now, um, we were comfortable last year because they started and ended the race at UMass, and that had minimal impact uh, on the town, and that was what was our concern last year. And the, the chair spoke, gave the kick, kick off to them at the at the road race. Um, one of the things we're contemplating and talking with the police department about is. Um, would it help businesses if we started and ended the race in the center of town or someplace near the center of town so that uh, usually when people come to run the race, they don't run by themselves. They have someone to you know, support people or you know, a partner who's with them, and then they're hanging around for an hour and a half. You know, or they'll, after you run the race, you might want to stop in and get something to eat or something like that. So we're thinking maybe we can create, generate some business on a slow Sunday morning in the center of town. Um, so that's one of the things we're thinking about a lot of logistical issues of parking and all those things that we'd want to address, but at currently it's still located, you know, beginning and ending at UMass. We'd like to engage in some conversations about um, uh, trying to u utilize this and leverage the number of people who come into town um, to generate more business for our businesses. Um, we did. We received no complaints about um, uh, about the race last year. Uh, there were some, uh, we learned a lot from it. There was an after um, race uh, debrief with our police department and others, and we now have some new plans on how they would, you know, what lanes of the road they would they would travel on. There was music at a couple locations, um, and that seemed to go well. Um, so I would recommend to you that you authorize the, um, the, the road closures or uh, um, rolling road closures that would be required for this subject of me bringing back a more detailed plan as we get closer to November. So I have a quick question for sure. you on this. Um, you're talking about changing the start location of the yep. race. <clears throat> I think one of the reasons they like starting near the Hanks Mall is because there's a big grassy, yeah. you know, quadrangle as it were, where they could set up a variety of pieces of uh, their operation so they could get people in and out and around and about. Um, and so I didn't know if you had any conversations with UMass about that part of it, and and or has it not gotten to that point yet to have a conversation with with the folks at UMass and what their thinking was or their feeling about that sort of thing? Well, UMass was supportive of it last year, and they're supportive of of it again. We've had general conversations, and they understand the value. They were doing it more as a favor, I think. Uh, they I think they would see the value. We've had just very general conversations with them, and they're not saying, "Oh no, we want to hold it here." They're open to whatever we we think is best for the town. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, I, mean, I guess I have a couple. One is uh, if we change locations, uh, do we know how many cars were had to be parked during the course of the event, either by runners or um, family? And uh, do we know that where we would plan to start and stop that we can accommodate within reason that number of people? Well, if there were close to 700 runners, there would probably be an equivalent number of cars. So that's a lot of cars. So that's one of the things that while we may want to be able to start it and end it in town, it might not be a possibility. More likely, it would have to begin and end at the high school. And then if we went that route, does it make any, even any sense for us to do that since it's not that close to town? So we might abandon that option. But it's something we wanted to talk about. And I gather that you've talked with the police department about uh, the route, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, the lanes um, in the street closures were uh, being listed. When I spoke with uh, Captain Gunderson about it immediately after the race, we were debriefing what she and I thought were the, was the biggest problem area, and she was suggesting that 
additional street closure in that area in the Cushman area mm -hmm. might be considered. I notice that it's not added to the list, but I assume that if that's what the department asked for later, that it can come back that we want to just give the certainty of the date and the commitment to participate to the foundation. Exactly, and I think they learned a lot about um, like running on the right side of the road and then having to cross the road like on, on Shea Street and things like that. And maybe if they were running on the other side of the road, there would be no conflict with, with they wouldn't have as many crossing the roads type con, um, conflicts with drivers. Um, so I think those are things that they would be recommending once they get the, the nod from you that you're open to it, basically. Ms. Gruber, did you have a question? I, I, it's a, a pass. Okay. Any other questions? Did you want to comment about it? Since you're here. And... In terms of comments. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to express our gratitude at the Amherst Survival Center for being designated the nonprofit to receive the benefits of this race. Some of you may remember that the Amherst Survival Center did try to conduct its own race for several years called the Cider Donut Run. And through that experience, we learned how incredibly challenging and labor intensive running a race is. Um, and in fact, when I came on as executive director, um, one of the decisions we made within after the first year was maybe we should suspend the Cider Donut Run because it really seemed to burn out volunteers. We didn't really have the capacity to do that kind of race. So we're thrilled that there is someone who can do it <laughs> um, and they're benefiting us. And one of the things that um, has come up in our conversations with the Hartford Marathon Foundation that you may be interested in is their real interest, I think, is a result of the town sort of supporting it to look for new ways to increase the donation to us and from our point also to increase participation in a food drive that day. So I'm hopeful that that will happen and so I wanna thank you also um, for that effort, but also our gratitude for being named, you know, just sort of the beneficiary of this manna from heaven. So notice all the food analogies though. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, any other comments or questions for the manager or anyone else? Do we want to take up the motion for this one? It's right at the very bottom of the motion sheet. It right. Goes I on move to approve the closure of the southbound lane of North Pleasant Street from Massachusetts Avenue to Triangle Street, the southbound lane of East Pleasant Street from Triangle to North Pleasant Street, the southbound lane of North Pleasant Street from East Pleasant to South Pleasant Street, and the southbound lane of South Pleasant Street from Main Street to Snell Street from approximately 8 a.m. to 8.40 a.m. for the Hartford Marathon Foundation's 2018 Amherst Half Marathon Road Race to be held on Sunday, November 4, 2018, with the condition that a minimum of 15 police officers funded by the foundation are available along the route as deemed necessary by the police and fire chiefs and further that the Amherst Survival Center will serve as the official charity with a monetary donation from each paid entry into the half marathon. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there further comment? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. And I just wanted to thank the town manager for following up on the concerns we'd expressed at previous meetings, so thank you. The other one? Yeah, since we're doing road races, why don't we do the yeah. other one while we're... So, so the other one is a race that's been going on. This is the Sugar <coughs> Loaf Mountain Athletic Club um, road race that um, begins... Um, what did I say that? It begins at the middle school and ends at the Wildwood School. And um, so this one was flagged, and, and this has been going on for, I think, 30 years, I think I was told. Um, I don't think it's ever come to you, but since they are requesting an actual road closure, we felt that any road closure had to come to you. Um, and so that's why it's before you. Um, and so the, the road closure they're talking about is on uh, Strong Street um, from the hours of 11 to 11.15 and then 12 to 1.30. Um, and so that's an impact on the neighborhood. There's not a lot of, and, and so that's why I think it should be aired publicly with you. 
Yeah. So thank you, I agree. Um, we all know that the, or maybe not everyone out in the public knows, that the Amherst Police do have the authority to do road closures when they find them necessary, and that's why occasionally when yep. there's some crazy big event, you might notice things that are posted that you had no idea that they were like that, but it's for safety reasons. I don't think that should ever be done for a race that we know about, and so there's no emergency there. The organization is obviously happening, and um, even if we've always done it that way, mm -hmm. I really appreciate you bringing it to us as an official thing because it shouldn't be treated differently. And along those lines, um, I have a lot of problems with the motion as written, and so I'm wondering if I'll just bring those up and then we'll wait for somebody else to craft a solution. <laughs> and that will be, it's not being done at the request of Chief of Police Scott Livingstone. It's no different than any other application. It's not his personal road race. Um, uh, well, maybe it is, but <laughs> maybe that's why he didn't need to ask for it. But um, as far as I can tell, it's not. So I appreciate the thought that was behind that, but yet at the same time, it doesn't appear that it's in a different place. And it, it's in a different physical location, but not in a different concept than the other. So we can remove that. And um, I thought it was quite important that the previous motion indicated that the police officers were going to be funded by the foundation. Mm -hmm. These police officers, they're not even mentioned in this motion, and they do need to be mentioned in this motion. They're specifically mentioned in the request, and they do need to be paid for by the foundation, or we need to hear about it differently. Because if they're just doing it out of their budget, I don't know why that would be. Right. So, um, uh, just copying that language over about the, f the number five instead of 15 and <coughs> that it's being funded by the organization. The question I have is, um, you know, you mentioned the sort of impact on the neighborhood. Is, uh, has anyone reached out to the neighborhood in any way, either road race uh, sponsors themselves, the police to sort of assess that uh, impact? Because a, a full road closure, even though it's think one it's a partial closure so it's probably one lane local traffic is still allowed um, it, it'll be a modest impact but not zero no I'm but so I think curious. I don't think they have an advance but it's coming up so we would have to do that sooner than later okay it's I have a more technical question it's closed from 11 to 11 15 and then 12 to 1 30 I'm guessing maybe that that's when they set up the you know cones or sawhorses or whatever they do and then they open it and then they the runners come like it's just weird like why wouldn't it be 11 to 1 30 or i don't get it i think they're trying to minimize the, the amount of time for the road closure so is it set up and then running or? yes okay yeah I think everybody starts at about the same pace. They yeah. just, when they finish, it takes a lot longer. <laughs> the end times well, for people. No, are I get long. that, but it's like they, they run out and set it up, but it's not really closed yet. Or yeah. completely. Mm -hmm. And they don't donate. They don't make any donation. No, it's a nonprofit. And this is in contrast to the um, our Hartford Half Marathon. This is done by volunteers, and it's a fund. They raise funds for their, their organization this way. I wonder, if I, I wonder if this suggests if we're going to be a popular place for road races that think about some universal policies like you fund the police, the off-duty officers, or you whatever, or um, what's the difference between a nonprofit and a nonprofit? So it's just something to think about because mm -hmm. we're going to the more we do this, the more inconsistencies there might be. Someone tailored the motion. <laughs> so I think that the motion would then be according to the, what uh, Ms. Brewer had uh, brought up, um, move to approve partial closure of Strong Street for all through traffic except local traffic on Sunday, September 25, 2018. February, February, 25. Tw February 25, 2018, from 11 to 11.15 a.m. and from 12 to 12.30 p.m. for the Sugarloaf Mountain Athletic Club subject, let's see, um, with the condition that a minimum of five police officers funded by the Mountain Club are available along the route as deemed necessary by the police and fire chiefs. Right. 
because then if they say they only need three, fine, they do it with three or they do 10 or whatever. And you said 12 to 1.30 p.m., right? Yes. But I didn't change the time. Okay. okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. All right. Thank you. We've taken care of those call items. And so we'll go back to um, section four of our agenda. Uh, and the next item there is the PVTA pros hearings on fare and service changes. Um, so in your packet were a couple of things, uh, actually a fairly extensive chunk of material. And, and then again tonight we had um, one other piece that I brought in uh, a couple of pages that will be added to our electronic packet hopefully tomorrow. Um, so the material that, that I gave you was a much broader set of uh, proposals than what actually will come forward for public uh, hearing. Um, so let me start with what I handed out this evening, which was proposed uh, fare increases. Um, this has a, a, a less obvious impact in, in Amherst, I think, because we, we have a lot of students and, uh, and uh, adults associated with the university that are uh, not subject to fares. But nonetheless, a um, couple of bits of background here. Uh, first off, the, the fares have not changed at PVTA since 2007, so it's been more than a decade since the fares have changed. They considered it in 2012 and had hearings and then decided not to alter the, to the fare structure. Um, on the first page of this, which has got a little 31 at the lower corner, in your printed copy, I did not put page 32 because it was blank, but it is a part of the, the materials will be in the, in the, uh, in the packet. Um, one other piece of information I'll share with you is at the very bottom of the fare uh, listing there has fare type and it says paratransit beyond three quarters of a mile and under the existing it shows a five dollar uh, number there. That is actually, they, they do not currently charge anything for that and I'll explain that in more detail later but that's, that's a proposed uh, charge for, for fares that, that they're suggesting independent of other, other changes um, but right now they do not charge for that. Um, the other thing I will point out is that the proposal that will actually come before the public for comment is proposal number two, which is a 25% increase in fares, which will take a standard adult basic fare, which is currently a dollar and a quarter, and raise that to a dollar sixty. Um, they tend not to want to work in pennies, which is part of why they pick numbers of that sort. Now, down at the bottom of the chart, you'll see maximum revenue increased, and it shows nine hundred and five thousand dollars. Uh, and a likely loss in ridership of $454,000. PBTA has found that in past changes to fares that the predictions that are used, the metrics that are used, the industry standards that are used to create those two calculations don't tend to hold up very well. So they don't have a super strong uh, idea of what will truly be the numbers that, that come out of a change in, in fare. Um, that will happen and what the change in ridership will be. There are national trends downward in, in ridership regardless of fares. Um, that's true this year as well in, at PVTA. So it's hard to know exactly what the ridership loss will be as a result of increasing the cost. Um, and for that matter, you know, one of the things is you raise fares and then you lose riders and so that reduces the amount of revenue you might generate. Um, the other thing is, as you look at this chart, you see a, a number of fare types. So, you know, if you just get on and pay the fare, it's a buck and a quarter right now. But what oftentimes is the case is people will buy, the most popular one that they buy is the, um, is the one-day pass, which is about five or six down from the top. And what that allows you to do is essentially ride the bus as many times as you like on that day. But it's, it, the price is set basically for a, a, a trip, a round trip, essentially, is, is kind of how they're pricing that. Um, there are lots of other options here. Um, but I'll, I'll mention on the paratransit beyond three quarters of a mile. By federal law, the paratransit or ADA uh, trips that are done, which are typically done with, with uh, specialized vehicles and, and vans and that sort of thing, are only required to get you to within three quarters of a mile of a uh, fixed route uh, ride. So they the, the federal... They, I don't know, they picked this out of the hat. They had some metric that they involved with, 
with uh, you know various conference committees, I'm sure, you know, to pick three quarters of a mile. But basically, if that paratransit ride gets you within three quarters of a mile of a bus stop, they can essentially let you out. And currently, we as PVTA uh, actually will take people to their destination, so we don't you know sort of apply any any sort of fee for that additional sort of carriage to to some place you know. Um, beyond what, what is required expressly by the, by the federal um, uh, regulations. And so they're thinking, well, we need, you know, as an organization, we need to recoup a little bit of that cost because those riders and those rides are, are very, very expensive. There's not a large number of them, but they, they do tend to have a, a, a pretty profound impact in, in some respects. So that's, that's part of why the suggestion of having some sort of, of, um, of fare there in, in case uh, when people ride, uh, further than that, that required amount. The second piece of the fare increase, and again, you'll turn to the next two pages here, uh, were a couple of different uh, models that were put together of ways to more regularly revisit the idea of a fare increase. So it's a, it's a less jarring sort of uh, circumstance. We've talked about this ourselves amongst our own fees and parking rates and, and things like that. And so if you look at these, the group that's going to be uh, potentially discussed at, at the public hearings, hearings is on the, the page labeled 33, which says a 25% increase in fiscal year 2019, then a 5% per year uh, increase implemented every three years. And part of the reason why they do it every three years is so they're not raising fees every single year, but also to get sort of round numbers that work when you are stuffing quarters into, into, uh, into boxes and that sort of thing. And so what you see is it's the increase uh, is shown for fiscal year uh, 19, and then the next one is in 2022. And so the overall increase ends up being about a 16% as opposed to 15, which would be three years, five years, five percent each. Um, and likewise, but then when you get to 2025, it, it works out to be about a 14%. Again, that's some of the sort of rounding thing to work with nickels and dimes instead of pennies. Um, but that's the proposed structure. Um, again, that's. Uh, a plan again in 2022 uh, they would have to go to public hearing again to have those conversations with the public and, and determine it and they may determine that their rates um, may need a uh, more increase may not need an increase at that point but this is just to sort of chart out a, a trajectory and and to show the uh, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation that they're taking uh, that notion of, of uh, revenue generation seriously and that they've got a plan of attack in, in forward years for for uh, accommodating, you know, uh, increasing uh, expenses against their budget. So that's the two things on on fare increases and proposals will be discussed uh, at the at the public hearings. In the other sort of larger packet, which starts with which has the header PBTA FY 2019 service reduction scenarios. Uh, the good news is you don't have to read all of this. Um, you can skip to scenario five because scenario five, which is just determined uh, or is named reduce off-peak service and restructure low performing routes and services is the one that was recommended for public hearing. What the staff at PBTA did was they looked at a series of uh, the first four scenarios to start with, uh, got some feedback from the routes committee and the paratransit committee about those kinds of changes and seeking some advice about how they might approach trying to identify reductions in service that would function well. Um, and so scenario five, which is, uh, I think on page 12, 12, doesn't have a 12, yeah, it's on page 12, describes the, the rationale that was applied. Um, there's a table in there, table 14, that talks about the strategies. And then on 13 is actual sort of, here's the nuts and bolts of, of all the routes. And, and one thing I will tell you is that the route numbers are not perfectly defined in here because Route 1 is actually G1, which is down the Springfield area. Um, but our routes are, are like 30 is one of our routes, 31, um, 33, 34, uh, 38, 39, 43. 43 is the one that runs, one of the runs that runs back and forth to Northampton. Um, I believe 44 and 45 may also be, I had a list and I don't have it with me, but nonetheless, there's a lot of, um, relative to the, the, uh, the routes in this area, a large number of them are, are <coughs> stopping the, the runs a little earlier in the evening in a couple of cases, um, running uh, what's currently a Sunday schedule on Saturdays as well, which is fewer runs, 
longer time between runs, um, making all the holidays run on a Sunday service schedule, whereas now only a couple of them do, uh, things of that nature. Um, and so the descriptions are, are in, in here uh, as to, to what the suggestions are. And then the third piece is the public outreach plan. Um, and so they've currently scheduled uh, two meetings in Amherst, um, Tuesday, March 6th from noon to 2 p.m. on the UMass campus. Uh, I don't know, I, I don't know, I did see a press release, I have not read it closely to see if they found a building on UMass's campus, but as soon as I uh, get a chance to look at that, we'll publish that on our website. But the 6th of March is when they're coming to Amherst, and then on the 7th of March, so on the 6th of March, it's noon to 2 at UMass. 7th of March is just across the street at the Bang Center from 4 to 5.30. Um, and they will do uh, a public hearing. Uh, what they did last time is they have a little bit of an introductory thing. They sort of frame uh, what changes are being you know, proposed, which you know, particularly getting into some of the things uh, related to, to the Amherst area. And then people have an opportunity to, to uh, step up and, and speak uh, to those changes. Um, they also take uh, phone calls, emails, uh, letters, sort of any method of communication with, with uh, PVTA, PVTA is, is allowed and encouraged and, and they compile all of that information and, and, uh, and use it to help sort through the, the difficult choices that are there. Um, if you were to, to tally up the changes that are, are in that scenario five, they actually tally to a little bit more than the total amount that they expect to be short. Uh, the current projected shortfall for fiscal 19 is about $3.1 million, and that's based on advice um, that the, the governor would fund uh, the regional transit uh, system from the state at about the same level as he did last year, which was uh, at the level that it was originally funded, and I want to say fiscal 15, but I wouldn't swear to that. I'd have to look it up. Um, so that's sort of the, the broad arch of, of what's coming. I wanted to make sure that you guys saw this early and that the public could see it in our packet, and then also that they knew about those dates coming up in March. Uh, they're trying to hit dates when elementary and secondary schools are not on their break, and that colleges and universities are not on their break, and so they're trying to hit a window of time where people that are in either of those sets of communities have an ability to, to get to a hearing and, and offer public comment. Um, like I said, there was, a, there was a press release Friday afternoon, which I will forward to, to town staff for inclusion on our website, um, which may have a little bit more detail than it's here as far as when the hearings are. Uh, they're doing several in Springfield, Holyoke, Northampton's got a couple on March 1st. Um, and be in Chicopee. They may have, they had a, a process by which people could uh, suggest uh, a public hearing in their own community. We had two already scheduled, so uh, I think we've, we've got an opportunity, but we can certainly go to other communities. Ms. Grewer. Well, um, two things. Uh, just, I think it would be good to have these materials that were in our packet sent specifically to the Transportation Advisory Committee, or the, at least the chair for dissemination, because they are charged with and very interested in public transportation. I think they made comments on one of the other proposed route changes. So that was just to make sure in our in our own outreach that we make right. sure they're on it and then they may have other things they want to do. Just um, you know, it, you know, it's, maybe this is the night for it after we talked about social services. We're trying to do as much as possible with not enough resource and um, I, I worry this is not probably new information for you, uh, Mr. Slaughter, but just when we look at the numbers, the numbers of our routes are so very much impacted by student riders. On the other hand, when we cut um, weekend, holiday, those times, we can really be um, having a negative impact on workers, on the lower income service workers who are trying to get here and back or, or from here, there, and back for jobs. So it's always a delicate balance between, you know, serving students who are clearly a, a big need in our system, five colleges helps fund that, but I also worry that when we, and we, we hear this all the time, like summer schedule and 
when we skinny down um, the, the uh, routes that were having maybe even more detrimental impact on workers, even though it might be fewer in numbers. So I, that's my concern. I think that's absolutely correct, and that's one of the things that I think keeps the folks at the administrative people at PVTA up at night is quite frankly because they recognize that in the PVTA, and we sort of a northern tier and a southern tier, and the southern tier is, you know, Springfield, Chicopee, Holyoke. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you look at the demographics of the population that rides though their services, it's uh, heavily tilted toward the lower socioeconomic status individuals in our communities. And they really rely on this service to get to work, to be able to have jobs. And so, you know, uh, it, it, more so than, say, an MBTA, where it, it's convenient enough that all spectrums of the economics, all people in the economic spectrum will take the MBTA because of the convenience factor that it has and the, and the, and the uh, service it provides. In our area, and I think this is true in some of the other uh, regional transit authorities, but especially for us, um, the number of, of folks uh, that use it to commute to work and it is their only means to get there or to get to the grocery store or to get to the doctor uh, is, is, is pretty significant. And so uh, it, it is an area that really um, is disquieting to the to the staff as well as the members of the advisory board. Um, as you know, as we have these conversations, they're really unpleasant uh, in that regard. Um, and I think they try to you know really look at ridership and when do people ride on any given route to try to nuance it as best they can. But you know, when when the buses run less, there's just fewer people are going to ride them because they can't fit into the schedules that are that are left, and it does leave, leave some people without an opportunity to to take advantage of them. I was particularly struck, Mr. Slaughter, by Appendix 1 and the Amherst roots and percentage of low income that are demonstrated on our own roots. Right. Yeah, it is, it is a striking number there in that, in that appendix. I was noticing that myself. And, and some of that is, you know, students are often of very limited means. Um, and you know, some people think, oh well, they're dependent upon their parents or that sort of thing. But there's a fair number of you know uh, students that are independent of their parents or are graduate students and have are fully independent of their parents, not even partially uh, independent of their parents. So I think, um, and we have working poor that that ride the bus to get to work, um, and there are people in Northampton that are working poor that ride the bus to get to Amherst to work. And so um, it's reflected here to some extent. One of the things that's required um, because you know, the PVTA receives federal money is what's called a Title VI analysis. And Title VI analysis is about uh, not having uh, disproportionate impacts on, on vulnerable populations. And so when they make changes and they recognize a certain level of, of disproportionate impact, they have to take mitigation factors into account. Um, and so there's a process, and that's part of the process that will go through. And that's some of the process that went through uh, last summer when they went, went through the, the, the changes to service that we had as well, um, they aren't perfect, but they do help sort of ease people and help them transition um, to the new service levels, but, but they are not in a lot of ways um, as adequate as what the service was by any stretch, but they do have to, to, to do that analysis and take um, that into consideration as they make, their, make the choices and recommendations and, and suggestions to the advisory board for, for vote. Um, oh, the other thing timeline-wise that I will <clears throat> tell you is that um, so these meetings are happening in March. We will, uh, the advisory board is going to have um, a, we have already scheduled an extra meeting in April, which we wouldn't normally do to, uh, I think, make the decisions based on the feedback um, so that the changes to the budget can be factored and figured out in a timely way so that we can um, implement the changes, uh, it fits in with the whole cycle of uh, when the budget has to be approved uh, and when the drivers have to do uh, their work relative to, uh, they actually bid the, the routes. So drivers with seniority have a whole process by which they actually choose the routes and the working hours that they want. Um, and that happens uh, over the summertime. And so we have to, there's a really long lead time on, on changes a lot of times. And so um, trying to be a little more ahead of things relative to last year's changes. Um, last year's changes were 
more focused on things that weren't working well for the PVTA, and so in some ways it was an opportunity to, to sort of trim some fat, uh, some service that wasn't really performing very well. I mean, that's not to say it didn't impact people in a very negative way. Um, this is going to be a, a, a more painful year uh, as far as cuts are concerned. Um, you know, and I, I thought about this recently with regard to uh, some messaging we may want to make to our to our legislators is that, you know, this is a is a direct service to people uh, in our communities that are most vulnerable. And so, uh, when we think about uh, ways in which our our uh, state budget has a has a profound direct impact on people, funding these RTA system uh, at a reasonable level is is really critical to having a, uh, uh, a significant impact on, on giving people opportunity to have success. We fully support you writing that letter. Thank you, Mr. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for going to Springfield for all of this because this is really going above and beyond. I get angry when I have to drive to Holyoke once every six months for something. So thank you for going ahead and dealing with this as well and taking that time out of your work day. Um, a couple of things, following up what Ms. Kruger said about Transportation Advisory Committee, getting this whole packet plus that press release, and then also Disability Access Advisory Committee would also be worth sending it directly to them. Then separately, as we have been doing over the last couple of times that we've done these, so this won't be news to anybody, but to put it on the town website in terms of a news flash, um, a news and announcements item, then the news flash to subscribers and on the actual calendar, for both the 6th and the 7th. And I mean, we can do all of that ourselves depending on, you know, in the we that could be staff or the we that could be volunteers, but whatever. And then that information can, since it doesn't necessarily have to link to our packet, it could go link to the PBTA website. But to have it out there for people so that as people are scheduling things for March, they're like, oh yeah, there's a PBTA meeting over at UMass and one at the Bang Center. We shouldn't conflict with that. Um, right. That would be really helpful to have those things there. And then completely as a side note, which is the thank you for doing this so that none of the rest of us have to, one of the things that I never understood, so I'll just throw it out there again, is this whole idea of buying date limited passes. I mean, bus passes are inconvenient enough to purchase now in Amherst. And the idea that I have to predict that I'm gonna make an investment in a seven day pass versus the old fashioned Charlie card where I put the money on and it's on there until I need it again. I would really appreciate it if you would share with, I can't believe this is convenient for anyone. And the idea that I am fronting a 31 day pass for a kid or a friend or an agency's doing it for an individual when maybe there's one week out of those three weeks, they don't need to go. And it just does not make sense to me to not have a deposit card versus I've got, a I've got card. good news. Oh, thank you. I'm so, <laughs> so happy to hear that. So they have a, uh, essentially a version of a Charlie card, a, a sort of, um, you know, a card that can be filled with a certain amount of money, basically, and then you use it as you as need you to. As you need it. Um, that they've been trying to bring online for a little while. Um, it's had a few hiccups in the way, but I believe the rollout is going to start, I think, in March, actually, to be perfectly honest. I, I, so it should be fairly soon that you'll start to see that. Um, you know, I think that the idea behind the seven-day pass or three-day pass is, is clearly targeting folks that are commuting to work um, and they have, you know, very sort of fixed schedules that that makes a lot of sense for them. Um, but I think the idea behind these smart cards uh, which is what they, I believe that's what they call them, smart cards, um, is that, you know, you can basically buy one, and then if you're an irregular writer, because your schedule's not locked right. in, you have the ability to use that over time. So it is, it is something that is coming, and it's sure. been in the works for a while, but it is, it is on the horizon, and probably sooner than later. But it's, it's astounding the complications associated with setting up a system like that. It right. really is. Part of it's about, you know, sort of being able to actually issue a card that will work and and you know finding places to vend them and et cetera et cetera et cetera right so. but I mean just to follow up for one it's, it's a very different situation here than a full-time worker obviously and mm -hmm. there are, we do have full-time workers who sure. are taking these buses that cost money as opposed to the free buses but um, there are also irregular workers so the, they're teenagers working part-time who are 
going over to Northampton to work at A to Z Science and Learning, for example. Right. And they're there for a few hours. And to have them to say, you have to keep rebuying seven-day passes when they work twice a week, maybe, right. um, doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you, as a parent, are able to uh, put some money into it, or as I said, an agency or somebody else is able to load a card for someone, right. that just seems incredibly valuable. So I'm really glad they're pursuing that. Mr. Wallen, you know? Since we're on the subject, I mean, how, how and where would they plan to vend these cards? Because if you can't get to the place to buy the card, it's not going right. to be very convenient. So they originally, I think, were hoping to, you know, have them in places like Big Y, but I think that that fell through. Um, uh, they had some outreach to some communities to see if the town halls would be able to do that. It gets a little tricky with, ha tricky with handling the money for it, so I think that complicates that a little bit. So I think it's going to be kind of a soft rollout. There's going to be, obviously... You know, the new um, Union Station that's open in Springfield is going to obviously have a kiosk. You walk up and feed your money in, you know, like a big vending machine kind of thing. Um, you know, your Chickpea Holyoke, those are going to be the places they're going to have it first. I think for us, it's going to be a little more, you know, difficult. Um, and I think there's still some, you know, questions to be answered exactly about where those things are and when they'll happen and how we'll, how we'll handle that. Because, again, it's one of those things, it's like, you know, in some places, senior centers might do it but then they have to handle money and keep track of it. I mean, they sell the seven-day passes and 30-day one passes and that sort of stuff now, and it still has its own complications and, and difficulties. But it is, it is one of the hurdles that slowed the whole thing down, I think, a little bit, is how do we get this functional for enough people to make it worthwhile? Uh, separate from, you know, we gotta change our boxes on the buses to swipe and all that jazz. But, um, so that is one of the, the concerns. And, and uh, But I can certainly, you know, if, if um, I mean, we did a, a brief exploration probably a year ago just to ask about, you know, doing it here in town hall, and I think it was a little complicated. I, I'm not recalling right offhand, you know, for us to do it at that point, but it, it you know, maybe something we want to revisit um, or do something in concert with, with Northampton to say, well, if you put one in, we'll put one in. That way people that are doing that commute back and forth can, can uh, you know, know that they've got a, a way to buy one on either end if they get stuck and they need to recharge their card or whatever. You know, it might be a mutual conversation with Northampton to, to make that work really well for us and, and for them as well. Thank you. So I think as far as just to tie, there's nothing to vote on at present. I just want to keep, you know, kind of paint the picture for folks, let it, you know, put the word out that the 6th and 7th of March are going to be days when hearings are going to be in town. Um, more stuff will come on our website. Um, and like I say, what's the material that's in packets a lot more than what really is going to be subject for uh, discussion at those those hearings because we, the the advisory board did narrow the narrow the scope a little bit. So, moving to our next item, which is litigation update. So, Mr. Bachman, do you want to take us through that? Yes, uh, annual. I think it's annually you get a litigation update from town council in writing, and this is dated January 31st. It's a four-page document that summarizes the active cases that the town is involved with, um, both um, includes normal litigation. Um, and then also labor uh, issues that are that we're dealing with. So if you have any questions, a lot of them have been resolved. As you can see, they'll say case is closed. A lot of times there are challenges to zoning board of appeals decisions that we basically monitor that someone else defends because whoever has the property interest in that case usually is the person, it's a group that's defending it. So. Any questions? Or you can ask me offline if you prefer. Right. Thank you, and thank you for making sure this got pulled together. I know we've been told by other uh, people that this is an unusual thing we do, but we thought it was responsive to our community <coughs> that they be aware of these mm -hmm. issues. So thank you. That was, all right. That's our, our litigation update. Um, next up, um, just skip around because I've been skipping around all evening. Um, why don't we do our resolution and proclamation? So we have a proclamation, uh, which we were discussing a little bit earlier about what was slightly different in the physical copy that was brought to us tonight. Um, just introduced that last year and for several years we've done an Amherst Black History Month proclamation. Um, and so, someone like to read the proclamation? Or should we just take action on it? Or just read the motion. 
I do, and under the presumption that we were going to vote for this, which I think we will, we do have a copy of sign. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's, um, there's a motion, actually. There is a motion. Mm -hmm. And then also, I think the other thing to mention is just the, um, along with this, is that there will be a ceremony right. on Saturday the 10th at, at what time? 11. 11 a.m. 11 a.m. It's, it's brief because it's always cold. <laughs> And so, um, and we always appreciate that um, staff goes ahead and shovels the steps for us. And we try, and we usually are able to have someone like Ms. Radway give up their Saturday to come in and uh, open the door so we can let people into the lobby, but yet kind of say, don't go down the hall, just stay right here in the lobby. She'll be um, here. She'll be yeah, here. that'll be great. And Ms. Radway also updated this document that a former member of the Human Rights Commission, a college student at the time, had originally designed for us, and she's been updating this for us each year. There's usually also a written program, which I have utterly refused to participate in updating this year. So I'm assuming that someone is either going to do that or we won't necessarily need one, but um, I appreciate that Ms. Radway has always stuck with this event, even when the Human Rights Commission has been supportive of the idea but not been willing to do the groundwork to get it up and gone. So, um, and Ms. Puppel always brings us the updated Black History Month proclamation and asks us for there any updates. So this is really a staff-driven event, and so I really appreciate them taking on the additional responsibility for this when we don't have volunteers who are able to take it on. And I also appreciate that we went ahead and raised the flag this year without waiting, because it, it to me, I mean, we would never want to suddenly see a flag we'd never seen before out front and wonder how that happened, but we've been doing this for several years now in a row, and to go ahead and get it up as early as possible when it works for our staff, I think, is, is a wonderful thing to go ahead and do, so thank you. Yeah, I, th I think uh, DPW did it, and it's already the shortest month of the year, so right. we didn't want to wait 10 days before we raised it, so. Um, do you prefer the motion or the full Proclamation or an excerpt from the proclamation? I'm really open to any of the above. Uh, I, think, I think it would be nice to read the full proclamation, but we could take pieces of it if uh, people don't want to read that long. You want to feel the urge to read nice. it? I'm certainly well, uh, happy to read it if, if we'd like to. So I'll do that. Okay. So reading the proclamation, it says Amherst Black History Month Proclamation, February 2018. Whereas, since the bicentennial year of 1976, Americans of all walks of life have come together during the month of February, quote, to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history, end quote. Whereas these accomplishments are the more remarkable for having been won at the cost of great struggle and sacrifice by men and women who came to these shores in chains and by their descendants. Whereas the authors of these accomplishments in Massachusetts history include Phyllis Wheatley, the first African-American to publish a book of poetry, Crispus Attacus, the first casualty of the American Revolution, Edward Jones of Amherst College, the second African-American to earn a college degree, Edmonia Lewis, the first professional African-American sculptor who learned her craft in Boston, the members of the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry, the first and most famous unit of African-American Union soldiers raised in the Civil War. Jan Matzeliger, inventor who revolutionized the shoe manufacturing industry. W.B. Du Bois, pioneering scholar and civil rights activist. Edward Brooke, the first African-American senator elected by popular vote. Deval Patrick, the second elected African-American governor in the nation. Whereas captive Africans and free people of color, color were already part of the Amherst story in the colonial era, era, whereas the African American residents of Amherst have fought for our collective defense and freedom from the revolution and civil war to the present, whereas the African American community, some of whose distinguished figures are depicted on the history mural in West Cemetery, or will be when it gets redone, <laughs> continues to contribute to the rich diversity and general welf welfare of both the town of Amherst and the Commonwealth, whereas to its shame, Massachusetts participated in the slave trade since 1638, but to its honor, in 1783 became the first state in the new nation to abolish slavery as inconsistent with our own conduct and constitution, thereby demonstrating our determination to live up to our historical ideals as we strive to build a better common future. 
Whereas, as former President Barack Obama proclaimed, every American can draw strength from the story of hard-won progress, which not only defines the African-American Ameri African experience, but also lies at the heart of our nation as a whole. Now, therefore, we, the Select Board of the Town of Amherst, do hereby proclaim February 2018 as Black History Month and urge all residents to mark this occasion and to participate fittingly in its observance, beginning with this ceremony to be held in front of Town Hall on February 10th, 2018. Thank you. So if someone would like to make the motion. <clears throat> sure, I will. Um, I move to proclaim <clears throat> February 2018 as Black History Month and urge all residents to mark this occasion and to participate in its observance beginning with a ceremony to be held in front of Town Hall on February 10th, 2018. And the second, is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Truly really beginning with the raising of the flag. Right. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Could we take a brief recess, Mr. Slotty? Absolutely. Why don't we take yep. a short recess and we'll get a stretch of their legs. way to describe it. Yeah. God damn, people actually pay. They, 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 They're supposed to check. You're supposed to either show an ID, you know, university ID, you right. know, on, on the back of the bus. I'm not sure how they have that. We don't. But I think in this sort of off-season they're a little more diligent about checking, but you can pretty much tell who's going to the university at this point, right? right. Well, they get, you know, the staff that ride, they get the regulars. The, the campus shuttle is yeah, basically runs pretty great. Yeah. So it's 34 and then it turns into 35. And the other yeah. thing is, is, and I only lived, I lived on Chestnut Street. So I usually just walked. I was like, all right, I'll take the bus. Sorry. I didn't know the bus route very well. So I got on the bus that would, would go by, but it went the wrong, <laughs> I got on the wrong half of the loop. So I went the wrong way around. I was like, so I gotta, I gotta walk, I gotta wait to either ride it all the way to the other thing. <laughs> So I just got off and walked at that yeah. point. It's like I'm just too embarrassed to. <laughs> it's like 25 years ago, but, but. No, you're probably on mic. Yeah. So I just was explaining the property. Yeah. 
when we're out of recess, which we're not out of recess yet. But not the second, I mean later when you find a space for it. Sign. A good sign. Hey, are you skipping moment. our February 12th meeting, Mr. Buffman? I, 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 I have to. I, mean, I, have to I was like, oh, you're just going to send some so back to that one or something. <laughs> I'm away. It's all good. I, I, that. I was like, uh huh. He's just going. He's like, I'm going out of here, so what else? <laughs> Do whatever you want. Thank you for the reasons. You're welcome. Well, since we're all back, um, we'll return to our meeting. Um, so next up we have uh, committee boards appointments and reappointments. Um, and so there's a series of motions there. Um, I can do these or the person from this committee who sat on the interviews if they prefer. Do you want me to do it? Okay. So. Um, just make sure this is one of, yeah. I move to appoint um, Nat Larson and Keith Nesbitt to the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, Advisory Committee through June 30th, 2020. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? Um, just to say I'm really pleased that we have some uh, mem members of our community have stepped up to serve on this committee. They're in the, as you, we heard earlier tonight, in the in the <clears throat> main part of uh, that committee's work. And there may be another one coming forward, which would be a full compliment then for that committee, which is like really happy dance time. So yeah, good. And if I could just follow up by saying, and one of the reasons we were able to work with these people is because it wasn't just they just happened to run across it on our amazing town website. <laughs> it was that personal connection thing. We always talk about that. We've talked about that no matter who's assigned to um, committee appointments. And usually the person's way too busy to do actual recruiting. But one person talks to one person who then talks to other people. And that's how these happened. It's that personal connection. So we really appreciate all the different personal connections that people made to help make these applications happen. The other thing, I know that we called him, Nat, in his um, interview, but just to be sure that if he wants to have his full name listed on things like like he listed on his application, maybe um, staff could check in when they send out the uh, letter, if it says Nathaniel or not. Some people like it to be one or the other thing. But it'll still work. I'm sure it will still <laughs> The important thing is, is that he will come. He, in fact, has already attended a meeting, he said. so. That's good. That's good. So we're really happy that both of them are joining us, and we appreciate them coming in for interviews as well. Is there any further discussion on that? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Those two are unanimous, if you would. Um, I move to appoint Sarah Essinger as an at-large member to the Community Preservation Act Committee through June 30th, 2020. Second. Is there further discussion? All right. Happy Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 So that's unanimous as well. Carry on. Um, and the last one. Um, it's incorrect. Is that a manager? It's the Human Rights Commission. Oh. <laughs> uh oh. Oh yeah. Let's just amend the motion. Just sheet. a cut and paste issue. But let's appoint, no, him. let's appoint him to the committee he wants to be part of. Oh, well, that would be. <laughs> okay. So. Um, it's a commission, just not. It's just not the commission. It's not the conservation we commission. Spin the wheel. I'll have to start with C tonight. So. Yes. Maybe we could have like the, wi the wild card application. Exactly right. Sign up and see C. what you get. <laughs> okay. I uh, move to appoint Tristan Whelan to the. Human Rights Commission through June 30th, 2019. Is there further discussion? I will just mention that aside from, as Mr. Wald points out, not all the C committees always get done on the same night, um, is that 
Mr. Whalen is currently a high school student, and that's one of the reasons his term is short, because we want to see how that works out for him when he goes off to college. But it has been long tradition, although not officially written into the charge, that high school and or college students serve on this commission. We don't have a separate youth commission, and we found that this is a place mm -hmm. where youth have often found that it's a valuable experience for them as well as for the community. So we appreciate him seeing if this will work in his schedule. Yes. Further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And um, just a, a comment in general, there have been a lot of um, appointments coming through, and that's great. And I'm really thrilled tonight. It's great. I don't know any of these, I didn't know any of the people, but for their names. So it's pretty exciting. But um, it's also just to thank all of our staff and the people who have, um, community chairs and others, Mr. Bachman, who have, uh, and, and Ms. Puppel in particular, who have had to schedule all of this, which is a kind of, um, a juggling match at best um, to get all the people who sit in the interviews lined up at the same day and time or somebody gets the flu and the whole thing gets scrapped and you start all over. So um, behind these motions are actually a lot of legwork for people and a lot of um, thoughtful participation. And sometimes people come in and they're, they're really great people. They they didn't get picked because of the mix we were looking for on a committee, and we thank them for their interest, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think next we'll do the consent calendar. I do have one change on this, um, and I want to double check the, uh, the actual application. I looked at it earlier. Um, the actual application for the, in, in the consent calendar under motion lowercase i, uh, for the Fine Arts Center lobby says April 12, 2018 from 8 to 12, uh, PM and the application uh, says 8 PM to 12 PM, but unless they're going to the next <laughs> yes. day or they're starting before yeah. they are finishing before they start or something of that, I well, presume, midnight, I assume that's an AM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, so I was going to do the same thing. 12 midnight was yeah. going to be my proposal. Right. Now the actual application says 12 PM, but I, I presume that's a, mm -hmm. a little scrivener's kind of error there because everything else is sort of <clears throat> in the PM. It's like one to four or yeah, three yeah. to five or something like that. So that was the one amendment I would make, but I would certainly take a motion for that consent calendar, unless someone wants to move them separately. Um, I move to approve the items listed on the consent calendar for the February 20, February 5, 2018 agenda as amended. Is there a second? Second. All right, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. I love this consent calendar thing that works. All right. So that's the sort of nuts and bolts things we have to do. Now we're into uh, our reports and comments section, which is going to start with the manager's uh, report. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, First up, uh, let's talk about the weather. The weather has uh, <laughs> gotten better, although we ex the, the extremely cold weather with the um, freezing has really done a number on our roads, and especially the crosswalks, and that's a real problem. We're trying to keep up with it, but as it rains, it makes the material just pour out. And, you know, having driven around the state, it's not a unique problem to the town of Amherst, but it's it's in every community. But it does speak to the need for us to invest in the, in our roads. Um, we anticipate a pretty significant storms on Wednesday. We will be calling a snow emergency on Wednesday so that you don't park overnight on Wednesday night. At this point, we're looking at probably, depending on how the weather um, looks, in terms of our staffing, we'll probably be, if we have to do cleanup, it'd probably be Friday night, just given how we try to manage our staff. If they're out all night plowing, we don't have them remove snow the next night. But we, we try to get it done before the weekend. Just so. to clarify, so the snow emergency would be Wednesday night into Thursday morning? Correct. And then again on Friday night into Saturday Potentially, morning? Yeah. Potentially, yeah. So second. I just want to give a heads up. Okay. It, it'll, um, we continue to watch the weather forecast where Monday we're two days away. Um, come Wednesday morning, we try. To, if there's a snow emergency that night, we 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 pledge to make the call by noon so that everybody knows they have plenty of time to move the car before midnight when it, kick, when it kicks in. Um, 
the Coffee with Town Manager will I'm going to change that date to um, the February 19th uh, for a number of reasons, just um, conflicts on a couple of items. Uh, again, haven't picked out the location or the department head, but I'll update you next week. Um, the um, one of the things that's been really uplifting to me is are these employee meetings that I've been having. Um, so once or twice a month, a group of employees comes in, five employees, randomly selected. Somebody picks them, I'm not sure who does, but it's someone from fire, police, DPW, library, town hall, LSSE, banks, wherever it is. And we just sort of talk for an hour and um, it's been fantastic. Just, and the biggest thing is, is the connection and, and respect they have for each other. And you'll often hear some employees, like if there's a police officer and a firefighter there, they'll say, oh, well, what you do is so important, you're saving lives. And they almost automatically respond, say if it's DPW, like one, one officer said, I couldn't do my job if you weren't here because I don't have a, 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 a you know, I can't cut down trees with something like, try, you, you and it was all these fantastic things. And, you know, someone to the library, well, we might feed, we might take care of them this way, but you're the ones feeding our their minds, and so they're re really uh, reinforcing each other's jobs. And it was really, it's really a very powerful thing, and most, almost all the time, the employees didn't know each other, so it's and they feel a little bit better walking out. So it's one hour, and it's it's been. I really appreciate the um, Steb Radway suggestion, and and I think it was. Um, so appreciate that. Um, see I'll, I'll just jump through and then you can ask me any things that you want to ask um, there was a um, many hour bid retreat on Friday where they brought a speaker in who talked about the importance of downtowns and how to um, the elements of a successful downtown so I want to share this with you this he's got he, he sort of does this like as a TED talk type thing so and these are the 20 ingredients to, access, to a successful downtown. It's something that they really glommed onto and are inspired to do something with. And they, there wasn't really a whole lot of post um, presentation talk, but these are the things that when he has studied thousands of downtowns and looked at the 400 <coughs> that are most um, successful, um, there are certain things that uh, they've identified as being important and one of those things for instance is um, to have a focus on a on a t on something that really characterizes what what do you tell say pe about your downtown to people when they first conceptualize it um, so it was very interesting I think the bid board and our economic development director was there as well I uh, found it really intriguing um, and inspiring and he encouraged them to go for the big pick to go for the big thing and one of the things that he was really focused on was a plaza, some place where people knew to gather. And I think there, there's a lot of focus on the work that we intend to do on the North Common and the Main Street parking lot. And um, you know, they started saying, do we need a parking lot there? Which like astounded me in that um, that's the most popular parking place in town. But in terms of what creates uh, a downtown is not a parking lot in this in on the, your most important corner possibly but something else that's happening there so big issue um, and so that's uh, the bid was pretty inspired by this and I think they're um, looking a little bit long term they do have a renewal up in the fall um, but they have some ideas for what they want to go forward with um, I'll come back to the social services memo at the end I guess um, the on the IT department working very closely with them uh, we you know as, as I mentioned before we have a three month plan six month plan and then we go out from there so uh, one of the things that keeps coming up and came up at the finance committee when IT presented its uh, um, budget was uh, the downtown Wi-Fi and so the goal on that is to turn it off and until we can get it up and running so it's responsible to, so people um, can make it work so that's a high priority for them and, and the other thing is the um, community bathroom um, is the, the lock system there is a mechanical lock isn't really working well that we want to get electronic locks in, in that because it helps us manage that space because sometimes people get in and then 
um, so they spend the night and things like that. It's not a good thing. Where's the community bathroom? Uh, community fields bathroom. Ah. Sorry. Community, well, community bathroom. Bathroom. It's our group bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Bathroom. <laughs> like so. I should that's fix that. Yeah, good point. So. Number 10 on the list here, you know. <laughs> I know, I know. So that's a community feel. Yes, I'm over sorry. There next to the high school. All right. Yes, yes. Thank that you. was my bad. Um, tonight, um, Chief Livingstone was meeting with the school department to talk about uh, the recommendation t uh, for um, polling places in the schools. Uh, they looked at each of the schools and the polling locations in each of them. Generally, felt there were some, with some, some modifications. Most of the schools were able to handle the polling without much disruption. Crocker Farm School was the one that was a challenge and their recommendation uh, or something to think about at least was to have a police officer there during polling hours. Uh, that's an expense. It's something that we wouldn't have a regular officer do and um, it's because we can't have someone who's going to be there and then be pulled away. So that's one of the things that we will have to be looking at in terms of making that area um, safer than it is now. So, uh, but the other ones they felt with the, with, you know, doors being able to be closed and access limited, they felt they were, it was fine, especially since the board relocated the um, Fort River School polling location to the gym. Um, a, color, a couple other pu um, public safety things, the um, fire department continued to monitor their payroll. Uh, they've um, really incurred, there, there's a lot of paternity leaves in, and they're trying to, so they're trying to fill the gaps. Um, in terms of making sure there's enough staffing with overtime, and, and but the chief has been doing a really um, good, I, good, um, really paying a good attention to it, so, and we're monitoring their their payroll on a regular basis, and he's taken steps to make sure he stays within his budget. And the same thing is true for the police department, as uh, you know, the um, grant, the burn, what they call the burn grant for ninety three thousand dollars, I think which we normally would have received by now. Um, the latest information is the chief does not anticipate that we will actually receive it. This is for a neighborhood liaison officer that we typically um, hire through this grant. Uh, it doesn't mean that we won't keep the employee on our um, payroll, but it does mean they will have to cut back in other areas in, in his budget so that he doesn't go over budget. It's, it's a position that and grant that he had counted on in the past. There has been no explicit communication to the town about this, um, but advice to him from people elsewhere in the state it has been don't count on it, basically. But there isn't anything coming to us saying because you are a sanctuary community, you are not going to get this grant. It's just not, the money's not being released. It's kind of this passive thing. And, and maybe there's a different reason, but that's the only reason that we can anticipate. I mentioned last time about the Hadley request for proposal for ambulance services and that we went over there and met with um, with their ambulance study committee and uh, two members of their select, select board and talked about the um, services and that we're rightly proud to offer them. Um, also mentioned that um, the cert we think, I think the service that we provide to them is worth more than what the town of Hadley has been paying us. And um, so they would dispute that as you would expect. Um, but I think, you know, they had gone out to market and I think this is something we will be talking about them about with them in a continued way. Um, damages, I previously reported about two cruisers in separate incidents that had been damaged. Um, then on January 28th, we had two ambulances that had been damaged. That's just minor damage. They're both in service. Um, but the, you know, just sort of cosmetic damage, but they backed into each one, backed into the other one at Cooley Dickinson Hospital. Um, so that was, those things will be fixed. It's been, we've been forwarded these things to our insurance company, of course. Um, um, oh, Cherry Hill, the, um, the Winterfest went up, went off on a Saturday night with the Lumieres on the town common and I wasn't there but I heard really positive things about it. The kid, kids really liked it. It looked really fantastic. I'm not sure if anybody, any of you were able to get down there but that was an exciting thing. And Winterfest continues through this entire week until February 10th when we will, I'm hoping some of you will be judges for the, uh, the chili, uh, the great chili uh, taste. 
um, as you're, they're listed celebrity judges, so maybe you don't want to identify yourselves, but. <laughs> I, th I think Ms. Brewer and I are going to be the celebrity judges. The since, select board. Since Assuming they, they're willing to take us without all five of us. We haven't been fired. Yes. So um, nobody else could do it. Uh, and then also the Beauty and the Beast I, I had, they had a remarkable run at Balcard Auditorium. The um, com community theater was, uh, um, I think every, pretty much every show was sold out, which is a really remarkable feat for them. Um, Town of Cullum, I previously had talked about, they were looking for a backup service for a treasure collector. Where that stands is they have hired a treasure collector they, who started and uh, will provide just educational support for whatever this person needs. Claire has been very good about offering that up um, to the town of Pelham just as a good neighbor type of thing. Um, the Sandy Center um, is moving forward. One of the things there is, um, you know, they, they ran into some issues that were not known to them, not known to us uh, in terms of electrical, um, the, the capacity of the, of the panels. Some of the panels were not labeled appropriately, so they relied on the label that were there. That was there when they got into it. They realized, oh, it's not the same. So they incurred some additional cost. Um, we're in some discussions about who should bear that cost. Um, and since we don't have an appropriation, I think the answer is pretty clear. But um, but they're we're helping. We're working with them to help them get to an opening date. They they've not seen. I've not seen an actual date, but I think they're looking. They're trying to get it finished. In, in March, and I'm trying to get you a um, maybe a tour of it before a, t a select board meeting sometime. Uh, it's, it really is coming together. It's, you know, they've got the dental equipment, and it's going to be a real huge addition to the town to have this. Um, it's really they've done a really nice job on the design and the construction. The um, let's see, medical marijuana. Um, one of the um, Happy Valley has um, it has the you issued a letter of non-opposition to Happy Valley at the Rafter site. Uh, there is a new company that's interested in taking over that site from Happy Valley. Uh, we're in some conversations with them about whether the board would issue a fifth letter of non-opposition, um, or if Happy Valley would like to. Would, we would like Happy Valley to relinquish their letter of non-opposition. They're hesitant to do so until the transaction has transpired. So we're in this little dance with two companies in the town where it's my reading of the board from, is that you weren't interested in issuing a fifth letter of non-opposition. So we don't want to have five hanging out there for whatever reason, but um, we'll keep working. If I'm reading that wrong, you should let me know. Um, but we can talk about that. The um, what else? Um, the, the, uh, North Amherst Library, four proposals from designs were, were received. They were meeting today. To, um, they received the proposals last week. The, the, the design review, the, com the committee that's looking at the um, proposals, I think they met today. I, I did not hear the results of that. Um, health insurance for the town is one of the big issues. Uh, we will talk a lot more about this next week. We had a, we've been meeting really regularly with our small group. We met today for just over two hours. Um, we have another meeting on Wednesday with the entire insurance advisory committee. Unless that gets snowed out, then we will have to move that to another day. We're on a very tight time frame. We pretty much have to make a decision on what we're doing by the end of February. It's tied into negotiations with the school because there's some provisions in the school's contract um, that inhibit what we, we all think we need to do. Um, and so that they're, they're, we know their schedule for their negotiations where they think they're going to be. So there's been a um, small group that's been working on this pretty successfully, I think, and we had a very good meeting today. Um, the key pieces that we have to decide if we want to stay self-insured or if we're going to go fully insured. Um, if we, right now we offered Harvard Pilgrim and we offer Blue Cross. If we're going to have two carriers or one carrier, and then our design, our plan design, which is the benefits that employees receive, um, has no deductibles and first dollar coverage. So um, that's something that doesn't match up well um, with all the other employers, private and public, in the in the community in the area. 
So as a result, a lot of people are choosing our plan if they have a spouse that, that has the option, they choose our plan. And we just think we need to have our plan look similar to other plans. We don't want to be the default um, insurer for all the for everybody. Um, let's see, for uh, Ms. Brewer mentioned about uh, petition articles under town meeting. We received four petitions, and I'm not I can't tell you if they've actually been certified or not. Um, and I'll get copies of these to you. So one is, and I'm not going to read these, it's a resolution calling for the United States to pull back from the brink and prevent nuclear war. Um, one is a zoning to amend the zoning map by changing RO, outline residential, to RLD, low density residential, in all areas of town neither served by public water nor sewer. Um, a third one, uh, which uh, is to change section 15.10 of the zoning bylaws. And I think this is to increase inclusionary zoning. I haven't read it carefully. Um, so the permit. And the fourth one is in an odd construction, uh, but it's to, to support an amendment to the town noise bylaw to include firing range gunfire. Signing this petition supports limiting firing range gunfire between 9 and 6.30 p.m and between April 1st through November 1st. Um, and so this is the firing range on, in, on the whole lake range. So uh, that's, that one's gonna have to be reviewed, I think, but it's something that will come to your attention in multiple ways, I think, when people in, in that area. So those are the four that were the zoning slash um, money articles that came in with the, we will see if they have the required signatures. Um, the and personnel, Maureen Pollock was hired as an associate planner, and she previously had served for five years as the assistant planner and conservation agent for the city of Greenfield, and she's a degree in regional planning from UMass, and um, a really good addition for the planning department. We're really pleased to have her. And Bruce Cleveland started as a building maintenance assistant, uh, filling the re a position that had someone had retired, and, and has been working at the Bang Center. Uh, Bruce is an Amherst resident with 40 years of experience in the residential maintenance field at two apartment complexes in the region. Uh, he has extensive experience in HVAC, electrical and plumbing, and we really think he'll be, he'll be uh, fleshing out our, our uh, maintenance team in a really nice way. Um, Adam Metzger started at the Western Massachusetts Police Academy as Amherst's newest patrol officer uh, recruit on February 5th. He's a Northampton native. He's a member of the United States National Guard is close to completing his bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Um, let's see. So uh, coming up for the um, select board meeting is next week will be sort of conservation and development. We will be talking about, um, so Mr. Zomack will be here uh, to no, February 12th, next week. Um, and so we're, so we're gonna put as many of the sort of Oh, right, yeah. uh, assistant town manager issues like <coughs> the uh, update on Groff Park, update on uh, North Common. Um, there's a number of other things that, that are going to come yes, before you. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. So, so anything, so anything that you have for him, if you want it on the agenda, we have agenda setting tomorrow. We're scheduled for that. Um, <coughs> and then two weeks or three weeks from today, February 26th, is when we will be bringing back the agricultural. It'll be a, sort of the DPW night. So we'll be bringing back agricultural um, water use. Um, we'll be looking at the, we'll have a presentation on our road management uh, pro program um, and pretty much anything we can think of for DPW so we can make, take, make use of their time here and make it and trying to sort of organize ourselves we that way. complete streets coming? That would be that night okay. too. We're and hoping tax, that would be that night. Tax that night yep. for crosswalks, right? Yes, that's According the goal. to your memo. Yep. So those are the big things coming up, and any questions that you may have, good answer. Mr. Wall, totally minor question, but since yeah. you mentioned the polling places, yeah. is there a standard policy on police at polling places? Because I recall having seen them sometimes, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. 
All the polling places. So there are constables at the at the polling right. places, and this what their suggestion would be, be would bring it up to the, okay. a, an actual police officer as opposed to a constable who is someone who <coughs> gets a lunch break and things like that. Yeah. So and so and so far we haven't been doing that ever. We have not. Some communities do do it though. Right. Um, they have a police officer at every polling location. So following up on that one, I do have a couple of other, but yep. following up on that one. Um, it's probably clear from comments I made last time we discussed this, but I really appreciate that that the police are working with the school committee on this rather than it just kind of being concerns that get raised and we didn't really move mm -hmm. forward with them. And so that's been really helpful and they're probably talking about it even as we speak because mm -hmm. it's on their agenda tonight. But one of the things I want to make super clear based on previous notes that have been, uh, opinions that have been expressed in our community about having police in schools. Mm -hmm that this is going to be a decision that's owned by the school committee and the superintendent, not by the select board and the town manager, even though, of course, it's your staffing. So from, this, from that standpoint, obviously, you can say no because you're the town manager. But what I'm saying is if you have an opinion about this out there in the world, share that with the school committee, not with the select board, mm -hmm. because right. that's where the decision needs to be made. That's who needs to be sensitive to the needs of the community within the school as well as <coughs> the public that votes at the school because of ex concerns that have been expressed in the past. This may very well be a great compromise. You know, this one school needs this because of that particular physical structure. But I hope that it's clear that they will be taking the lead on that, not us. Yes. Trying to avoid public comment <laughs> 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 on an issue that's really not ours. It really but, is. So. It's their building, so they have to decide how they want us to help manage that. You're right. Other questions? I have a couple for you. Sure. Go ahead. All right. Um, so one thing, just back to public safety, a couple of questions there. You're talking about monitoring the budget of the police department, important grant from the U.S. Attorney General's office. Um, is, I, I presume there are other communities in the Commonwealth that are under a similar struggle as far as the grant. Is this something that the state's attorney general is looking into as far as putting pressure? In other words, if the grant's been awarded and then they're not sending the cash, that's... You know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a weird space to be in, but it's sometimes, you know, do we have to sue the federal government mm -hmm. for the money is what I'm getting at. I mean, it seems like an odd thing to do, but at the yeah. same time, is this something that... Well, I don't think it's an entitlement, so I don't think we would have grounds for suit. It's a discretionary grant. It's money that goes to the state and then right. from the state gets allocated out. Right. Um, probably like we have to do a CDBG, the state has to do with theirs to the federal government. We have to then... Once we decide what we want to do, CDBG, we submit it to the state, and they say, okay, that looks good to, to us. Um, and this is one that where the money hasn't been released. It was explicitly not released in the city of Lawrence for this same type of grant, um, but no other community that I know of has had that happen to them. Okay. Um, just to Could just follow up on that? Yeah, yeah, um, we we'll talked about this a little bit before, but just is there a way to at least pursue this, maybe starting with our delegation and ask them to look into it, and then uh, depending on that result, maybe going further up the flagpole. You talking about state or federal delegation? Uh, what do you think? Well, if it's going, if it's flowing through the state, maybe that's start the there. First, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. start yeah, there, and then um, if there is something that our wonderful attorney general might want to help us with, but we don't have enough information, but I think start okay. the process. Um, just to, to follow on in public safety, um, something that crossed my mind when you're talking about the ambulances, the damage shows are on, on January 28th. Mm -hmm. um, I was noting the time of day, and I've, I've, I've brought this up before, given that we work 24-hour shifts, and they start at 7 a.m. That's 19 and a half hours into a shift, theoretically. Um, do we think fatigue was a factor? Uh, and, and how it, and it, asks, it begs a broader question for me generally around accidents that aren't caused by other drivers but our own, um, do they tend to fall at certain times of day, certain parts of those long shifts? Mm -hmm. That sort of thing, has that been considered, looked at, thought about? I know that you know, you're, you're doing some follow-up conversations with um, you know, building on the firefighter study that you mm -hmm. had, and that talks you know, about how to staff, and, and this gets into those, those are, they're independent in some ways and very dependent in other ways, and so I'm just sort of curious if you have any thoughts about that or, mm -hmm. or um, in knowledge, I mean, it's it, it's less about this particular circumstance, but mm -hmm. just thinking about the notion of you know when you're 20 hours into a shift, right? Are you as sharp as you were in, in hour two? Yeah, I don't think that was the circumstance in this. I know this wasn't that wasn't the circumstance in this situation. Um, the chief reports that it was basically a distraction to the driver who was slowly backing up and 
someone distracted him and that's why it ha it's just an accident that um that happened mm -hmm. the and i think that um and he said i asked specifically that question and he said fatigue was not an issue in this in this case Good. um <laughs> You know, I have the same concerns you have about 24-hour shifts, but that's something that we went to a long time ago, and that's a contractual issue. So moving away from that is probably not going to happen very easily. We're in negotiations with the fire union right now, but we're not talking about that in particular. But we are talking about the uh, recommendations from the study, which was a daytime surge shift that happens during the day, which is when the, our busiest times are to have additional firefighters on duty just during the day, not following the 24 hour shift because it gets kind of quiet between two and six in, in the morning. So why do we need, so that's my argument, for, but, but it's a good conversation we're having with them about a number of issue, different issues. Um, and this is all plays into, this is a recommendation from the, um, you know, from the, from the study, so. Okay. Thank you, that was the only things I had. Do other members have questions? I did have a couple. Um, one is associated with the letter for what was Happy Valley and yep. will now be somebody else. Um, so we were dreading this happening, I think it's fair to say, mm -hmm. in that when we got to numbers three and four of those letters, we realized, wow, we really don't have any guidance here. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to make this up as we go along. And then, of course, after we did number four with some level of discomfort, then <laughs> recreational, also known as adult use, came into play and changed the playing field completely. Not just sure we could all predict that something was going to happen, but to say that suddenly the things we'd given out for medical were now going to apply to recreational, which was not something any of us intended when we, we may have decided the same thing, but it wasn't part of the conversation. So awkward, mm -hmm. because now it's the same site so that's not different. Um, it still meets with zoning. We, we've set up, it's not like we've changed zoning since then to prevent it from being there. Um, yet at the same time, hmm. And I think part of, I mean, I, I would say very, from, very much for myself that I think part of the reason we were willing to go forward with the letters as we were was because we didn't really have a reason not to, so we don't like to say no to business opportunities, and we, we also all firmly, I think quite firmly, were in support of medical marijuana happening years ago. We've been waiting for it to happen, and once, it certainly feels to me like since recreational became available that medical's been dragging its feet since then and not putting in the money because they're waiting to see what happens with recreational. So that's really unfortunate because we all wanted medical to be available for pain relief to people. Um, so given all that frustration, trying not to take that out on this applicant, I can also see that they're gonna sh show up on the 26th and we have no way to be prepared for doing either thing for saying yes or no. I don't see that we've learned anything since the last time we did it that will help us make a good decision unless the only thing we're basing this decision on is that it's the same site. So I mean, that would be a way to do it. But other than that, I just don't know how we would decide yes or no. And again, we are interested in pain relief and we are interested in economic development and we do support what the voters wanted to do, but the voters didn't necessarily realized they were changing all the medicals that had non-opposition or letters of support into recreational. So what I fear is them coming in and me being cranky like this, and it's not their fault. I mean, they're just buying a property and maybe going to be providing a service. But I don't know what kind of process we're supposed to follow to figure this out. Well, I think, I think they at least have the right to come in and talk to us. We're not... <coughs> I mean, that's what they're asking for to be on the agenda. Then we have to hear them out. And I wouldn't presuppose what we're gonna say because we haven't heard from them and I think it's okay for them to come in. It does not, just because they're on the agenda does not presuppose any outcome. Can I just follow up on that? Sure. First of all, one, we don't have to let them be on the agenda, but we're doing, if we are gonna let them be on the agenda, I think it's offensive to only let them be on the agenda just to say, well, we just, said you wanted to be on it, so we'll let you be on it. Like, we have to be prepared to do something or not, I think, in terms of giving, to give them an expectation. Like, 
thanks for coming to talk to us. We're not prepared to talk about this or we are prepared to talk about it. I think it would be unfair for us to say, well, we're just letting you come talk, but we may not do anything. That's what I'm trying to get to is what will we do to prepare for that meeting? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Slaughter, I just want to say that uh, I'm a little uncomfortable with this discussion because it's not a posted agenda item unless you make a determination as the chair that it should be on the uh, discussion because it was not anticipated by you 48 hours in advance. Well, in, in some respects, that's the case. I, th I, I think um, what I would suggest is that if we keep talking about it, about whether to have it as an agenda item as opposed to which, you know, for the 26th, I'm okay with that conversation because I want the feedback about whether or not you want this on the agenda or not on the agenda and what concerns you have about having it on the agenda. Um, when we get into what actions we might take on on that agenda item that's that's a that's a more uncomfortable place for me but I think as far as just the conversation about the agenda item and you know uh, sort of setting our own expectations around it a little bit um, whether to have it on the agenda or not on the agenda or we could you know we may also decide to I mean fortunately it's not next Monday <laughs> so we have a little bit of time um, both from a courtesy standpoint to the to the folks that are that are seeking that but as as well as for ourselves to think about this um so i would i would in the short term at least offer people the the suggestion that they should think about this as an agenda item and and sort of funnel that to me directly so it's not a uh, an open meeting law sort of thing where we're all sort of having conversations not in an open meeting but i i do take your point about the 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 fact that it's not really on the agenda, uh, on, mm -hmm. on the agenda, so therefore it's it's difficult to discuss it. Um, I mean, like I said, my, my suggestion would be that we kind of each consider it a little bit and get feedback to me about it um, soon, um, so that as we set agenda, we have some sense of I get a sense from each of you individually about about that and 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 to your point about sort of you know what does it mean by having it on the agenda, sort of what what action would we or would we not take? Uh, what expectations are we setting around that? I think we all, I mean, I personally need to think about that a little bit myself, but yes. Thank you, I appreciate it. Because one of the, th the quickest ways to make my hair stand on end is to say, we're gonna put it on the agenda because they asked for it. Ooh, we used to do that 10 years ago, it was a horrible idea. Just because, we, and we, we would just sit there and listen to people talk and then we'd say, okay, now what do we do? I mean, it was mortifying. And so I'm, saying that if we choose to do this on a night that already looks pretty busy with DPW stuff and all the other transportation stuff you guys have already set up, um, to be thoughtful about, and it, whether that, I mean, I'm fine with saying you tend, if that's the date you think is the right date, um, mm -hmm. that then to say then next time we talk, meeting next Monday, we should talk, this is I think beyond the normal agenda setting process in terms of um, people having to necessarily feed it to you by a certain date or whatever, but to be able to say on the 12th what we're looking for. And we may not all be satisfied with what happens on the 26th in terms of process, even much less outcome. But we could then talk about, I mean, unless somebody has an objection to that night because of all the other things we're doing that night. I don't have an objection to that night. What I have an objection to is it just going through the standard thoughtful, yet this is an unusual situation agenda setting process where we don't know what we're actually going to be doing on the 26th in terms of how we'll frame it. And so if we could talk about that briefly next week as a posted agenda item, like how do we talk about letters of opposition and non-opposition and support as opposed to how do we talk about Happy Valley turning into something else? That would be totally fine with me. I'm a little confused and I, I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> so right. the open meeting lab, but I'd be more comfortable next time we talk about whether we want it on the agenda or not, because I think I'm, I'm a little confused. Maybe I'm not quite in the same way, but I, coming up with a decision about how we want to deal with something that might be on our agenda before it comes seems sort of um, like pre-deliberating on something that we haven't even heard from yet. I am willing to um, trust the agenda setting team and the manager to decide if this is ripe for this. There's a reason why this should come now, whether it's not, and I might have implied just because they asked, they get it. They, and a lot of people want to be on our agenda, but if um, people have been in communication with that, 
applicant. I mean, they have to go through us, so there's a reason to ask this, not just an idle, oh, I'd like to be on the select board agenda. Right. Um, when the time is ripe for that, I would leave to the agenda setting team and the manager. I'm having trouble predetermining how we're gonna approach it before we actually hear what we're being asked to do. We know exactly what we're being asked to do. We were already told what we'll be asked to do. We'll be asked to give them a letter of support. I'm asking us to decide, to talk about next week, post agenda, how we're going to talk about that issue this time around because we haven't done it well, for a while and we've learned not very much, but about a whole lot of other things, but not much about well, that structure. Why can't we talk about that when the applicant is here? Why can't because we they don't need, they, Yes. <laughs> I don't believe we should discuss with the applicant how we develop a policy on how to deal with the applicant's concern. I find that ridiculous. I think that that is, is offensive to the applicant and it's offensive to me. We need to at least figure out if it come when we get a question, I mean, it would have been nice maybe if we'd guessed this two years ago that it might come up again, but we haven't had to deal with it. We've been lucky. And so how are we going to talk about it? Because we weren't happy the last time we did one of these. And so some of us might have, maybe we're happy. I, <laughs> I just don't see we how we weren't we're, united. Uh, let's put it that maybe way. Maybe we weren't united. I just don't see how we can come up with a policy about something we were going to be asked about that I don't have all the information for. I, I just, I, 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 I'm, I'm just, I don't get it. So I, the way I'm seeing it is sort of two different conversations. One's about sort of what do we, in a, in a broad general sense, how do we approach this topic? When, when asked for a letter. When asked for, right. regardless of whom and regardless of where in right. town, right. Uh, right. obviously within zoning it is appropriate, of course, but, but I mean, there's that question. I think uh -huh. that's the one that I'm hearing you sort of articulate you'd like to discuss a little bit next week, as opposed to when an actual sort of request comes and now we have to, you know, sort of essentially apply that sort of rationale to the situation. So, um, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking as far as just, you know, as, uh, I would welcome the conversation about sort of how we approach these a little bit, because um, I felt we got caught a little flat-footed in the past, partly because we originally thought there'd only be one allowed in town, and then the that state, got changed, the state and law changed. suddenly the we were kind of uh, not ready for a, a, a deluge, as it were, uh, of medical marijuana. So I think some thinking about the rationale behind what our what our criteria are, you know, whether it becomes formal policy or not, but just broadly sort of what makes us comfortable or uncomfortable um, about it, any any uh, request for this sort of letter um, would be a useful conversation. It may continue on the night that they're here because we may not come to a perfect, you know, sort of perfectly buttoned up idea of what we want to do, but I think that It'll, it'll be helpful, I think, to do that, I think, a little bit on, on next Monday night, perhaps. Um, I would appreciate that. Thank you. But, but we're not talking about the specific ask by that group. No, no, no. I, I see that as, that is on the 26th. The I think it's about. And that will be on the 26th. Yeah, think? I think Unless kind of separating those into two would be best. I think 26 might be. We should talk about that. The applicant had asked for February, so and I didn't think we had time to put it on. But the 26th is going to be a heavy meeting, so. Right might not be well, the best. Yeah, so they may get <laughs> And you'll know more about that when we meet on the 12th. Right. How right. full yes. that right. 26 looks. Right. Okay. Thank well, you. thank you all for that. Appreciate that. It's it, it you know, we've kind of been dealing with it by not dealing with it and I just, we don't have to deal with it. I think it's dangerous if people intuit, like if the manager says, well, I think the board doesn't want to do this, or mm -hmm. we weren't happy. I mean, that may, may end up being true, but I think unless we have that conversation, there's a spectrum of feeling and opinion. And so it's really hard if you project on, they're not going to like this or they're going to like yeah. that. So we have to go through the process. Yes. Yep. For your point. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's why I want to have the pre-meeting, so to speak, about it. And that's the why this is so pre, fun. The pre-argument. <laughs> pre-argument. The structural the hypothetical argument. That's right. Um, I actually have another item associated with the town manager's report. Yes, please. So that is, I would think it would be entirely appropriate, despite it not being on our agenda, 
for us to go ahead and have a motion to the effect that if those zoning petitions are certified in terms of signatures, that they're passed along to the planning board because technically there's that thing under Mass General mm -hmm. Law that we have to send it to them and why wait until next Monday? That seems really silly. I mean, we're gonna give it to them anyway. So as soon as it's certified by the town clerk that that's just like gone. Do we need so a motion to do that? We, we have done that in the past um, irregularly. Um, I, I moved to do that, <laughs> so um, yeah. <laughs> Something that shows that to the effect that once the zoning petitions yeah. once certified should be forwarded to the planning board under whatever section of mass general law that is because it's like it's out of our hands right. but it, but officially it's supposed to be passed over to them by or us to us and back to them and then to so we have a motion in a second yeah. is there any further discussion on that hearing none all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. Done. Yes. all right um are there other questions for the manager regarding his report? Just, um, he didn't mention it um, orally, but it says that you're going to, Mr. Bachelman, you're going to be a keynote speaker at the Massachusetts Continuing Legal Education Annual Municipal Conference on March 7th. So I wanted to call that out because that's um, quite an honor. And then you said, um, I'm not sure what I'm going to be talking about, but then I saw in the program that um, they did give you a topic. Yeah. Which you can tell us, and did you still want our ideas? I do. Um, yeah. So the the topic, the headline is um, establishing and maintaining a good working relationship between the municipal attorney and the municipality's chief administrative officer. So that's the topic. Mm -hmm. But I was just sort of thinking, you know, if there are things that you think it would be useful for other lawyers to hear about from your experiences, um, I have my own personal experiences. I'll be building a, a little talk around. So, do, do you want us to do it now or talk to you after? Talk to individually, yeah. Okay, I have some ideas. Appreciate that, later. yeah. Um, I think the only other thing I wanted to ask you about, you had a memo on our packet regarding um, community services oh, funding. Right. Did you want to add anything else <laughs> about that? Uh, no, just that uh, that's out. Um, I think we've talked about this a couple times, but just to sort of close the loop on it, that an RFP was issued um, to for, um, Basically, to for to target the Latino community uh, or residents who are native English speakers um, for food security issues and to do greater outreach. And one of the things that one of the needs that's been identified uh, among the social service community and the social ser service community in Amherst is pretty well organized. They meet pretty regularly, uh, led by our health uh, director, and they talk about the needs of the community. And this is one of the high profile needs that would be eligible for these funds. And the other piece of information that was really important to this is that learning or getting confirmation from our comptroller that these are funds that could last beyond June 30th. Um, so these can be gone through the next, so it's basically a 15, 16 month contract. So that meant an actual program could be developed. And as opposed to previously, I presented to you two things, two different options. Um, or not options, two different programs within this, these funds, it seemed better and wiser for us staff-wise and uh, impact on the community to have, focus all the money into one area. Um, I have to say that this, the way this money came up, it didn't go through our normal budget process. It's taken an enormous amount of staff time and you have two representatives from the board who've been focused on this as well. Um, these sort of one-offs create um, it's just hard to f figure it out and it doesn't go, it's much better for these things to go through our normal budget process um, versus something popping up. Because I wanna, you know, my, my issue is I wanna honor the impulse of town meeting because this is what they, the town meeting voted to do, but it's sort of taking this out of, in a separate path, it just, um, it creates all kinds of issues for us. So, but that's that's the direction we're headed. Um, and we'll see how that works out. We'll see what kind of proposals we get, and I'll keep you updated as the proposals come in. <coughs> Is there further questions for the manager? Uh, we'll move on to member reports. Who would like to go first? All right, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> so I had uh, spent a fair amount of time um, uh, talking about PVTA, which is the primary thing. A secondary thing that um, 
as a member of the uh, Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, um, we have subcommittees. One of the subcommittees is on uh, policy, and so we're, we're working on uh, crafting uh, some goals and, and a policy around housing. And, and I've mentioned this before, I'll mention it again, is that the idea is that that policy would come to the select, you know, besides the trust adopting it, select board would adopt it, planning board would adopt it, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're spending time thinking about um, you know, sort of how to shape that in a way that, that makes sense to all of those different boards. Um, but I did want to put it on your, on your uh, horizon as something that's coming probably we're in February, uh, probably in March would be my guess. Um, if we can get our, our uh, pieces put together, we had a pretty robust conversation last, last week about it at the subcommittee level um, regarding some goal setting. Um, you know, one of the things that a point I raised and, and it kind of just occurred to me while we were at the meeting is the SHI that's required to, uh, by the state is at 10% is sort of that threshold they're talking about. They want people to get above 10% and, you know, Amherst as a community has really been, been committed to being above that, that level. But there's probably some upper limit, bef you know, that you, that you want to stay bounded by so that it doesn't have a deleterious effect in, in, in other ways. And so it's like sort of, can we articulate sort of what that is? And in much the same way in our financial policies, we want to try to keep our reserves between five and 15% of, of our budget. You know, we have a boundary there to, to, to guide ourselves. And I think the, the same may be true. And I don't know, I want people to think about that. And, um, you know, that there might be a similar sort of thing for that percentage of our housing stock that's, you know, counts on the SHI list. It's a funny sort of thing because, you know, for example, at Rolling Green, the entirety of it gets counted in the, in the count, even though only 40 or so are actually at a discounted uh, affordable level. Um, so it's a weird kind of calculus that goes on there. Um, but mostly I wanted you to just be aware that we'll be getting um, that policy from the, the Affordable Housing Trust um, probably in the next month or so and, and they'll want us to, to take action on it and, and join with uh, Planning Board and, and others in, in adopting that as a policy uh, and, and some targets for, for affordable housing in the, in the, in the future. Um, and I think that's it for me as a member report. So do others have items? Mr. Steinberg? Yeah, I think I'm only going to report on one thing. Uh, lots of the committees that I'm assigned to will be meeting over the next week or two. So, uh, might be having a more complete report next time. The one thing I wanted to mention is that, uh, Ms. Kruger and I went to a meeting along with uh, Mr. Bachleman that was um, organized by the proponents of the um, zero net energy uh, bylaw. And uh, they, it was the second of two similar meetings where they brought in an architect who had worked in the field and was, um, did a presentation and provided information um, about um, the opportunities and the challenges. And, uh, you know, that was my takeaway, that there's some real opportunities because costs are probably going down and um, people are learning more and more about construction. On the other hand, we're learning a lot more about challenges and we're also identifying challenges to the bylaw as it was constructed and which was the reason that we as a select board had asked the town meeting to refer it back to us so that we could do further work. We are um, continuing in discussions with the uh, original proponents and um, to see if we can still um, achieve some better understanding of some changes that um, might make it a um, stronger, more workable um, bylaw. And uh, I really can't at this point go into further um, report because um, this is very much of a work in progress and we haven't had that meeting with them yet. So there really isn't anything else to report. Thank you. Others? Just to go in order, um, and Andy reported on that one, and we've had um, two 
meetings since we've met, since this board has last met, of the Recreational Marijuana Working Group, or maybe soon to be called Adult Use, because that's the, the, the whole um, effort is, is trending that way. Um, because we partly um, getting ready, thinking about um, what might be done for the, the annual town meeting and what might be put off. We had the um, building commissioner, Rob Mora, come to the last meeting and work with us on that. Um, and today I went to a hearing along with um, planning director Chris Brestrup at Hoya Community College where the CCC was there um, listening to people about um, the draft regulations. And I, Ms. Brewer can cover this, but some of the Amherst people are going to Greenfield tomorrow to do the same thing. We sort of divided because we had of schedules. Um, and Mr. Kravitz had already submitted written testimony because the letter was dated January 17th, which I think you had seen in a prior packet. Um, so I spoke very briefly at that hearing, just referring to that letter and then underscoring a few things that we thought um, we would like more clarification on. And um, they definitely seem to know who Amherst is at this point. They've gone to like seven things and some of the same people, but I think that's valuable because I think we have a presence and a face. And I, I just did mention briefly to them that we did have a, 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 a team who was on it and that um, we had used that approach as a way to work on this and follow it. And, um, um, we, uh, actually, nobody mentioned um, we were, um, three of us were at the meeting with Senator Markey. Um, at first there was a smaller meeting um, to meet with him and talk about sanctuary communities and, and raise some issues and it was mostly focused on Lucio Perez um, and his taking sanctuary in our community at the Congregational Church and then went on to a town hall style meeting at the middle school. Um, and so I think there was a, a lot of, um, which packed the middle school auditorium to the rafters. I've never seen it that packed. Um, a lot of interest from our community and people in the region had come also to listen to him and to talk about issues. So that was, that was pretty neat. Uh, I think for me that is, Probably it for now. You should probably well, go because you've got a you've got a, a follow up on the marijuana. Well, I well okay. <laughs> you, you can't stop me to talk. Can't stop talking about marijuana. Okay. So I'll go after you. Um, yes, I hope you all appreciate that when I was trying to uh, drive here and I need really we needed to make a note about to ask you about something about the hearing today and to make sure I covered it tomorrow. But you know, when you try and talk to Siri when you're driving, Siri doesn't always understand what you're right. So I thought of something that I thought Siri would understand, and now that's in my calendar. And I'm like, don't like that. It says smoke marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> that was Siri's translation. Siri totally got that. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, the point was around the fact that our, our health board of health, our director of public health, et cetera, are very concerned about, you know, where there's a lot of talk about social consumption, but uh, remember how we don't allow smoking in bars and restaurants and mm -hmm. places of work? Um, that we can't suddenly change that because it's a different item that's that, in there. That and we and should, so we, we, look, we will it. talk about that. But that's just one of the many, many little things that has not been clearly lined out in some of these things. So um, yes, I'll be going to that with Ms. Fetterman tomorrow actually. And so we will see what, and we will continue to have Amherst presence there since Mr. Kravitz can't be there. Uh, that's okay, we'll just split the difference and do it two separate days. Um, in addition to the wonderful events that we were able to attend associated with Senator Markey, we also, I would appreciate that the people who worked on the sanctuary article made a point of engaging the select board in that separate private meeting, recognizing that we worked together to make a very viable town meeting article that could then go to town meeting and not have to be argued about over the technicalities of it versus 
the overall sentiment of it. And so it was, I was again reminded of what a good process that had been with various people working together, Ms. Kruger in particular, who also appeared on television with Ms. Murray. And so um, it was good to be re-recognized, associated with that, and then have that opportunity to hear some really moving um, information from not only Lucio himself but and his family, but then some other people who like local college students who are DACA students. And to see that clearly, Markey was very engaged in what they were talking about, and that was really great to see. Um, the day before that, we'd had the not quite as enthusiasm building for towns meeting that we were almost all able to attend. And so obviously everybody else knows that, but just for the people out in the public, we give up our weekends too. Make sure you're clear on that. Um, and that was a difficult conversation, and as you indicated in your report, you know, still more to talk about associated with regional budget, and there will be regional school budget cuts. There's just not any question about that. It's just a question of how many there will be. So obviously people following that want to follow the school's budget, but we have had some dealings with that as well, trying to figure out how as a town we'll be able to pay our assessment for what will in fact be reduced services at the middle school and high school level. Um, one of the other things that I attended on your behalf is the UTAC meeting, had the executive meeting, and that is run very ably by Nancy Buffone from the UMass side, and Tony Maroulis, and Dave Somek from our side, and Jeff Kravitz. And so, um, but I attend that because, you know, we're an elected body, and so we asked to be part of that, and we did, in fact, hear more about the bike share program, which really we'd pretty much already known, but it was good to make sure everybody on the steering committee at UTAC knew what that was, steering committee, executive committee, whatever we're calling ourselves these days. And um, so that was that was very practical. And we also heard about a big art project, which honestly, I don't even want to share the slides with you because I looked at some of those things and I was like, yeah, okay, sure, fine, whatever. Um, it's all gonna be great, public art, um, temporary, but it will make, there's an interest, it's an interesting project to, you know, sort of have that whole walk come from UMass down into the town and so, it, it's called a bridges project and it's a great idea. So it's individual pieces of art will be thought and comment provoking. Let's put it that way. Does it come back to us in any way? Um, as far as I can it's tell, the not. Up. They most, Base, all the things seem to be it, things that you're associated with. So, and so it, it, I mean, uh, it should come to you. I mean, we'll do a presentation of some sort if that's what the board wants, but it's, it's all in public parks, but um, it's not in the public way, for it's example. It's not in the public way. Um, the as long as it's especially since it's temporary although some people have said well we'd like to make it permanent permanent makes a big difference i think mm -hmm. to the town if you're putting up a piece of art it's temporary but it's a big change and and it is worth knowing that it's going to be extra work for the town manager and dpw and everybody to talk about this because we they are talking about concrete footings and things for things that are only going to be temporary installations but they will be there for like six months so i mean there's a purpose to it, but um, but yes, some people will say, oh my word, did you put some new permanent art there? And yeah, it's and gonna be an interesting conversation. And the idea is to have, they have enough money to replace it so it looks like it did before they started right. to put Take it there. Right, the footings out. Mm -hmm. put the exactly. Out. That kind so of thing. Um, it's a very ambitious schedule. Very ambitious. Can't imagine this is really gonna happen, but it's exciting, because it's mm -hmm. the type of thing that might draw people into town who, very, is, is so. very, very interesting. Those marathoners. That's what I was going to yeah. say. It's like <laughs> they can run around. That's right. Well, actually, exactly. right. You can make, then they are talking, of course, of having a map about it and everything. Yeah. And the, the thing that's actually hardest for them is because it's based out of UMass rather than based out of here, mm -hmm. is that it all needs to be installed around the same time as graduation. Not a good time to be tearing things up for grad. So, so it, it makes it hard. And so that we'll see what comes out of it, but I don't believe we'll need to do any approvals. It's just that maybe as it gets closer, we'll see more of a heads up as mm -hmm. to what's happening with it. So that will be interesting. And um, so, right, marijuana. And I also participated briefly on our behalf at a leadership institute run by our new state rep, Solomon Goldstein Rose, yesterday where he was following through on his idea of engaging younger people in government. And so I went and talked to literally a handful of people. But it was, you know, it only takes a couple, as we have found with our committee appointments. And so it was great that they were engaged and they came on 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning. I didn't, but they did. And I went in the afternoon. Um, I was like, no. No, that won't be happening, but uh, I won't do that on your behalf, but I will do <laughs> 3 o'clock. So lots of things going on. 
one other thing I just want to ask us to do, and, and the, if our uh, mics were still on during the recess, is I wish I had thought of it before and that we should add it to our permanent calendar, but associated with the decision we made back on November 20th that was very public, we made a motion then about how we would do the deadlines for our warrant articles in terms of the citizen petition articles. That's not things that come out of the planning board or things that come out of the select board or the trust or anything like that. It's the ones that have to get signatures. And we made that decision that we do, as I believe you more clearly elaborated on it, it you know, zoning bylaws, regular bylaws, anything with money, basically anything that's not a resolution. And the resolution, we did get one of, which was great that we got it early, but those aren't really due until the 26th at noon. So I was going to suggest that we have some sort of formal way, since we don't yet have it on our ongoing calendar, of saying that the warrant is indeed closed to those issues as of today at noon, just, as, just reiterating what we said on November 20th to make sure it's super clear to everyone, but that if they still have resolution things or if there are things that are perking through committees, those can continue to come in following the guidelines that staff has to follow in order to get them ready in time for things. Would you suggest, uh, if we drafted language for that for next week, would that be? Well, it's to, we don't want anybody to think it's still next week. I mean, that's what I'm saying, is that the, the warrant's closed not a problem. now. Right. And so maybe what we're just doing, since we don't yet have it on our calendar, is I'm asking that we put it on our calendar for, for next, next year. year. Just as we always say, every month, every year we look at the Black History Month proclamation, and every year we right. do the town manager's budget on a Thursday, and every year we right. do this. Um, let's add voting to close the warrant on that. It's just awkward because when you say close the warrant, then it makes somebody on the planning board nervous that somehow you know they're not going to get their stuff on, and that that's not what's happening. But in terms of the petition yeah. things, we have the right to close the warrant associated with petitions. Right, we're closing a portion of the warrant. Yes, <laughs> we're closing the petition portion. PP? Partial, uh, partial closure. <clears throat> Some sort of acronym associated with that. Okay. So don't send us anything else unless it's a proclamation, in which case you still have until noon on Monday the 26th. Resolution. Um, Resolution. Resolution, proclamation, yeah. Speaking of proclamations, didn't we get an email of one for the skating? Mm -hmm. We and did. What, how do we deal with that? I mean, it's coming up on our agenda or what's going to Um. It hasn't so gone through agenda setting. It had came right. in. It just came in. Okay, so it goes to agenda setting. Right. Or, or we could comment right here that I don't think we should do it. But we, I think we had that conversation <laughs> we <did>. before. <laughs> we did. We argued already. We had we had this conversation because we knew it was coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that will leave it to our team of agenda setters. But it would be kind of awkward to vote against it. But um, I'm not. I, I just bring it, slippery bring it, slope. Bring it on. <laughs> so, do what you need to do. Just the thing I was going to say, but I forgot. Um, and all the excitement. <laughs> yeah, no, and Ms. Brewer fortunately covered the question of public art, so that's, that's good. And, you know, and it has been an issue that things that are often done in many areas as temporary measures tend to become permanent through uh, inertia. Witness, for example, the, the walls that have now finally changed here in various public places. So something to think about. Uh, I'll be brief since it's late. Conservation Commission has been very busy, as you may be gathering from the agenda coming up with Mr. Zomek, and that's a good thing because it means there's activity and economic growth and construction and things like that that's being made to fit with our natural environment, and that's all a good thing. Historical Commission is taking up the slow process of revising the words in the demolition delay policy. And most important of all, if you know already know from the newspaper and elsewhere, there's now the chance to create the dog park on town land. The original plan was to go forward in two tracks and pref a preference for town-owned land, but to make a request to CPAC for a private property purchase if necessary. And it looked it was going that way, but then Mr. Zomek very cleverly found space on the old landfill. So that means the CPA request comes in at under half the original one. And this will be a thing in which the, we have to do certain things with town money, but actual work in the dog park could be funded by a, uh, a grant from a private foundation. So it's a, very, it's a very good deal overall. And there was an article about that in the paper, what, week ago? I don't know. But in case people weren't noticing that, that'll be on the, the agenda. And there's that change in, in the funding, which is nice. I'll leave it at that. Great. 
So I believe that brings us to the end of our agenda, unless someone has something else unanticipated from before. And if not, then I would take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so we're adjourned at 929.